pundit talk shows there is inside the eye live where we break down some of the weekly mainstream media talking points before the talking points even get aired that is some entertaining stories weather cats intriguing and informative guests and you get one of the most listened to saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today and it's all right here on our flagship station Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, the Fed, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together, we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Hello everyone and welcome to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com and I'm your host Janet Kierlesson with my co-host Dr. Sasha Lesson and today we have a very special guest. He's got an incredible new book coming up and his name is Grant Cameron and Grant Cameron is the recipient of the Leeds Conference International Researcher of the Year and the UFO Congress Researcher of the Year. He became involved in ufology as the Vietnam War ended in May of 1975 with personal sightings of the unknown of a UFO type project which locally became known as Charlie Red Star. The story has been optioned for a movie. I'll have to tell us about that. These sightings led to a decade of research into the early work done by the Canadian government into the flying saucer phenomena. Cameron became the authority on the government program and Wilbur B. Smith, who headed it up. From the here, Cameron proceeded to do almost three decades of research into the role of the President of the United States uh, in the UFO mystery. He is one of the foremost authorities on Hillary and Bill Clinton and their UFO connection. And most of that research can be found at the President's UFO website, which is www.presidentialufo.com. Uh, let's see. After experiencing a mental breakdown, no, <laughs> mental download. <laughs> yeah, that too. That too. <laughs> that too. <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> this isn't my normal computer. <laughs> download event. I get downloads all the time, and they feel like breakdowns. <laughs> uh, <laughs> on February 26, 2012, Cameron turned his research interests away from nuts and bolts research to the role of consciousness in the UFO phenomena. This new research has expanded out to the possible involvement of extraterrestrials in modern music and in the phenomena of inspirations and downloads in science discoveries, inventions, Nobel Prizes, its music, art books, near-death experiences, meditation, and with individuals known as savants and prodigies. So it goes on and on. Uh, this uh, bio I'm reading is from aliencosmicexpo.com, aliencosmicexpo.com, and Grant and... Yours truly and Dr. Sasha Lesson. We will be meeting up there all uh, the, what is it, the, I don't know, uh, the June 24th to 26th, 2016, at the Best Western Brant Park Inn, which we're flying into Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. Sasha, what would you like to say? Well, this is uh, going to be a great show. Uh, one of the things that I, I'm going to uh, ask Grant is Will Billary beat Obama and Pope Frank? To, uh, to blabbing on the ETs. <laughs> uh, the other question I have is, uh, what does a Trudeau uh, rule of Canada mean in terms of uh, disclosure, what I suspect is a heck of a lot more liberal stuff? And then there's some other stuff. I've been reading John Lay about the uh, secret BC base, which was supposed to be the main place where the anti-grav uh, craft were, uh, were developed, and whether you know anything about that. So those are the things that are on my little agenda. <laughs> And my list is your new book. So, okay, take it away. Tell us what you want us to know. 
Grant Cameron. Oh, okay. Um, well, recently I've gotten dragged back into the, um, the political arena. Uh, I did work on it, as the bio says, for 30 years, but I'd actually dumped it all. I said, um, basically, I came to the conclusion the president knows. He's not going to tell you, and this is a total waste of time. And uh, as you probably know, I sort of have my 15 seconds of fame. I managed to get the Rockefeller Initiative documents out of the Clinton White House, this thousand pages of documents that, that Steve Bassett talks about all the time now that are on his website. And I'd actually given those documents away. I figured, um, you know, this, this is, uh, I've got, I'm into consciousness now. Um, it's more important to my understanding of what happened to me in 1975. And so I'd given the documents away. I gave all my FOIA material that I got from the Clinton White House because what happened was, when I got the uh, thousand pages of documents from the Clinton White House in 2000, uh, it gave me all the names of all the people who had been involved. And so um, what happens with uh, a president when a president leaves office, he has five years to work on the papers from the, uh, the administration to do his memoirs and do whatever he wants with them. And then they go into this arena where they're open to Freedom Information Act requests. So I knew exactly when the uh, the thing would open up, the FOIAs, and I filed immediately, and I filed about 100 FOIA requests with the Clinton Library for all the names and all the people and all the, um, the different events that took place. And so you'll see a lot of the stuff like the, the famous Hillary Clinton with the book, with the uh, book on uh, this uh, – implications of uh, the discovery of extraterrestrial life for that all came through my FOAs where I, I pulled the photographs and and all this kind of stuff uh, but I had given up on it and I had sort of um, given the stuff I gave some to uh, the the main set of files I gave to uh, Dr. Joe Bookman who was one of the moderators at the citizens hearing in Washington DC for Steve Bassett a couple of years ago and he had run for the Independence Party and was very much into politics so I said well Here's the documents. Good luck. Uh, make sure you know something happens with them. You do something with them, and uh, I'm on to other things. And then suddenly, um, Hillary Clinton um, made this disclosure. Well, actually, she didn't do it. This is one of the sort of the illusions that people have, is that Hillary has brought this issue up and that she's using this for votes or whatever. And it's really not true. Hillary did not bring it up. Hillary has never brought up the UFO subject on the campaign trail. She has answered four questions. She's been asked the questions, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But anyway, in, in December, December 30th, uh, she was asked by a reporter at the Conway Daily uh, Sun in New Hampshire, which is a key newspaper now because this is the um, one of the first two states that starts the presidential election cycle. And uh, people who are running for president will spend up to a year there. Because the old deal is if you can win uh, New Hampshire or Iowa, you get the momentum, and that gives you a good start to, to winning the whole thing. If you lose those, you're basically out of the presidential race. So um, the, this newspaper was asking all the different uh, people in the campaign except for Trump. And the reason they didn't ask Trump was because Trump really doesn't talk to people. He was just sort of flying around in his 757 jumbo jet, and he doesn't – all the rest of them were in buses going from town to town, doing the town halls, answering questions, talking to people. But Trump didn't do any of that. He just would appear for a, a, a big rally and then fly back out again. And um, so this uh, Damon Steer, who was the reporter, uh, had uh, Hillary – and he'd, I didn't re realize he'd actually asked Hillary in 2007 – when she came through during the, the for her first run for president and asked her about the UFO stuff. And she said, oh, yeah, I was very interested in it. And she said, um, and this kind of shocked me. She said, do you know, she said to Damon, do you know that the most requested item at the, at the Clinton Library was FOIAs? Or was uh, the most requested item at the Clinton Library was UFOs? Mm -hmm. Which kind of shocked me because that was my, my stuff. And I figured, like, you know, all, all these years I figured, like, nobody's paying attention. The president's, you know, not saying anything. Nobody's doing anything, and suddenly here you get some woman who's running for president, who's very aware of what what I did at the at the library and the fact that that UFOs was of great interest, uh, and that there's a lot of FOIs filed on her husband's papers. So she uh, stated to him, "Yeah, um, you know, I'm interested in the subject." And then this year, in, on December 30th, she made the announcement to Damon. She said, "Yeah, John Podesta and I, I promised John." that if I become president, I will uh, release 
the UFO files, as many wow. as I can. I will look at national security implications, and I will um, I, I will release what I can. And when I heard that, I went, oh, my goodness. You know, here, you, 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 I give all the stuff away. And I, I looked at the polls, and you could see already in December um, that unless something very unusual happens, she's going to be the president. Oh, yeah. And I, I, could, I could see the polls coming. And so I went like, wow. I, I mean, I've written a lot of stuff on the Clintons. I think on my website, there, there's there's just piles of stuff. And so I figured, well, I'll just throw all the stuff together in a book and, and just basically – um, do an authoritative history on the Clintons and UFOs because they've been very in, very involved and very interested. And uh, so I put I put it all together, and now it's about to come out. It doesn't get into I, – I always tell people it's not a political book, and every time I sort of bring it up on Facebook, all the Hillary haters come out, and I keep saying, well, don't pay attention to Hillary. I really don't care. It's got nothing to do with the election. It's just the fact that these two people were very interested in, in UFOs. They're very powerful people. And Hillary has made this this announcement that she will will disclose, and uh, I stay away from all the. Um, I, I have three levels of conversation. Of course, my mother or somebody when I was very young taught me this. Your your high highest level of conversation is ideas about about ideas. Your second level of conversation is about things, and your third level of conversation is gossip about people who aren't in the room. So there really is no gossip about the Clintons or what happened with the Clintons and stuff like that. Uh, but there is a book for people who are into that and, and you know want to see all the sexual uh, innuendos that happened and, and what happened. And there's a Secret Service agent who's now coming out with a book on on the um, June the 28th, and he will probably sell my book by about a million times. And um, he's he's uh, was there. He was one of the people that testified on the Monica Lewinsky. What was going on there? And he's coming out with a book about what was going on behind the scenes with the Clintons. My my story, the Clinton book, is just basically what happened. Why why are the Clintons interested? And uh, I get into uh, a long conclusion. And I have changed. If you go to my website, I've said all along. I've sort of bought into this this idea that the presidents didn't know. The presidents were out of the loop. And so for about the last 60 pages of the book, I go through the question, does the president know? And I've absolutely changed my opinion. I say there's no doubt the president knows. Uh, the whole story that there's a Wizard of Oz or some uh, uh, you know, evil cabal running the show, this is disinformation to keep it away from the president. Mm -hmm. And so I go through this whole thing. I go through the constitutional aspects of uh, would the president know? Uh, I go through uh, all the different presidents and uh, reference different items. There's a, an appendix that I have where I reference um, if the president doesn't know, then why did this happen? Why did this happen? And I go through events like um, Richard Nixon showing Jackie Gleason the bodies. Well, if he doesn't know what's going on, he hasn't got access to the body. So there's all these indications. But the most, the ones that really sort of set me to change my mind are Barack Obama statements. Because if you listen to Bill Clinton when he was in president or when he talks about it, he basically just goes to party line. He basically just says, no, I didn't know what's going on. There's a government inside the government. I, don't, I didn't know what's going on and stuff like that. And when people like Ben Hansen do reviews on his, uh, his uh, interviews, it shows that he's being deceptive, yeah. that he's really not telling the truth. But if you see Barack Obama, Barack Obama, and, he's, and I, I detail these in the book, Barack Obama's gone through a number of different uh, situations where he's been asked about, about uh, aliens, UFOs, Area 51. And he has never lied. He has never said, I don't know what's going on. He has said such things as when he was in Roswell, New Mexico, talking about the Roswell crash. He said, we'll keep our secrets here, which clearly indicates he knows what's going on. He told um, uh, Will Smith's son, Jamin, uh, Dame, uh, uh, Jaden, he said, you know, he said, I, I'll neither, I can neither confirm nor deny that extraterrestrials have visited the Earth, but if they had, and if there had been a top secret meeting, it would have taken place in this very room. And they were in the Situation Room at the time when he told this uh, there, uh, yeah, when, he was, yeah. when he was when he was asked. What about this kid that he he said, if I told you, uh, then I'd have to kill you. Okay, yeah, that, that was in Roswell where he said that. He said okay. that, um, and he's used that joke a number of times. He was first asked by... Um, this guy works for CNN now. Um, I can't remember his name. He's got a long, complex name, but he works for CNN. But originally, he had a, a show out of um, it was either Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. And in 2009, when Barack first came in, he asked him the question about the uh, the, the Book of Secrets. Mm. And this is when the uh, the movie came out with the Book of Secrets in it. And he said, "My kids have watched the movie, and I just need to ask you." Um, 
is there a book of secrets? And uh, my kids are interested in Brock's. And that's when Brock first used that joke. He said, uh, yeah, there is, but um, if, I, if I told you what was in it, I'd have to kill you. So he used that joke with the kids, the, with what he says in Roswell, New Mexico. And this is 2012. And, and New Mexico, even though it's going to vote on Tuesday, is no longer a swing state. It's more like a democratic state now. But it used to be a swing state that would go either way. So every election... That right at the end of the election, the presidential can- candidates would show up in Roswell, New Mexico. And when you go to Roswell, New Mexico, everybody knows the story, so everybody has to do the, the some sort of UFO or Roswell joke. So uh, Bill was there in 2012 during his re-election there, and that's when he said, the question that's asked to me most by 9- and 10-year-old kids is, Mr. President, what's the story with Roswell? Is it true what they say? And that's when he says, and I tell the little kids, I say, you know, if I told you that, I'd have to kill you. And then everybody laughs, and he says, and you, and you can see their eyes get all big. And then he stops, and, and I've done enough work on presidential speeches, especially I did a lot of work with the Reagan speeches, trying to find out uh, why did Ronald Reagan put all these alien invasion remarks? Did, did, was it signed off by people? Uh, did people dispute this being in the speeches? Because uh, people have to realize that when, when a president makes a speech, like a State of the Union address will be drafted 30 times, and it will be reviewed by 25 different agencies. And so it's reviewed word by word, and every agency has to sign off on it. So every agency will take a look, and the CIA may say, I don't want this in this speech, change this, State Department, everybody gets to sign off on the speech. So I would study these speeches, and so I, I got to understand how speech, presidential speeches are written, and I know it's very careful. There's no really, um, he's really not speaking off the cuff. That's, you know, Donald Trump. Everything is the way he's accusing Hillary right now of reading off a teleprompter. That's how it works. Uh, it's very carefully orchestrated. You have a, you have a group of 100 people. They're doing focus groups. Everybody's trying to figure out what to say, what not to say, stay away from this, go to this su- subject. And so uh, what happened in this speech is Brock makes this joke because he's got to make the Roswell joke. And then he hesitates. And you can see in the, in the, if you watch the clip of the speech, the video, he hesitates and he's not into the speech. And that's when he says, we'll keep our secrets here. And then he starts the speech. So this was an ad lib. This wasn't in the speech. And I can almost guarantee it was in the speech. And uh, so he says that. And he's and, and when he was on um, Kimmel, of course, Kimmel is very interested in UFOs as well. So, of course, everybody that comes on the Kimmel show uh, talks about UFOs because he, he always asks them about it. So what had happened, what started it was Bill Clinton went on there. And uh, Bill Clinton was asked a UFO question. And, uh, of course, Kimmel was saying, you know, if I was there, you know, the, 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 my hand would just be off the Bible. The Bible is to be hot. And I'd right. be running to the White House to find out, you know, about the alien stuff. And, of course, Bill <laughs> says, well, you know, I, in my second administration, we had that thing about Roswell. And I looked into it. In, and, and he said, um, I, I pulled all the files and I read them which uh, sort of goes contrary to the fact. He says, I don't know what's going on. I'm out of the loop. I don't know what's going on. But I call. I, I got all the Roswell files, and I looked at all the Roswell files. And he looked at all the Area 51 files. But then he's saying, well, he doesn't know what's going on. So anyway, he says, I, you know, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I, I looked into it, and no, I don't think a, a UFO crashed at Roswell, New Mexico. And, um, of course, that was the one that when Ben Hansen did the review on it, it showed that Bill Clinton was being deceptive. So what happens is then Barack Obama comes on the, on the Kimmel show, and we're almost certain, we, we can't prove it, but we're almost certain that Barack Obama knew the UFO question was coming. Because you don't put a president on on a big show like that without knowing what the questions are. It's very, As I said, it's very orchestrated. You, you have all these people who control what the president's asked, you know, who gets to say what. Because the, the president is it's a, it's a big thing. They don't want him, you know, looking stupid or whatever, getting into trouble. So he's going, he, uh, Kimmel starts off the interview and he says, Okay, I'm going to ask you the, about this UFO thing, and you realize they're going to be watching what your all the moves that you make and how you hold your hands and stuff. And Barack agrees, yes. So the, they're referring to the, the Ben Hansen review. That Ben right. Hansen had done this review on Bill Clinton and determined that Bill Clinton was lying. So he warns them, you know they're going to be watching you. They're going to do an analysis of, of how you react when you answer these questions. And Barack says, yeah, okay. So they start, and he asks them a couple of questions. Then he goes to the question, he said... Um, okay, Bill said he didn't get anything. Bill said he went there and he couldn't get anything. So I got to ask you, what did you do? What did you find out? And because this is high definition TV, when Ben Hansen does the review, when he does the analysis of, of Barack Obama, 
they're watching his lapel pin. And if you remember, this lapel pin is very famous with Barack Obama because Barack never wore a U.S. lapel pin. He always had this thing, and, and it was always like he's anti-American, he's anti against the military and stuff. And so now he always wears this lapel pin. And this is what put him down in this interview, <laughs> is he's got this lapel pin, and Ben Hansen is watching the lapel pin on high-definition TV, and you can actually see Barack breathing. And so they're counting the breaths as he gets asked this question. Okay, so Bill said nothing happened. You were there. What did you do? What? what and that's the ultimate question is, is, is as I said uh, to many people, if you ever get a president, vice president, four-star general, the unified command, somebody who might have been read in, what you want to ask him is not, what do you think about UFOs? Have you seen a UFO? That is, they're going to walk around that question. The only question you want to ask him is, have you been briefed? And that's basically what Kimmel said. What did you find out? When you got there, what did, what did you discover? And that as he's ask, answering this question, the review on, the, on Ben Hansen's review, watching the lapel pin, shows that he's breathing at 42 times a minute. And the average breath is like 17 to 20. And this guy is almost hyperventilating. I mean, he's like <laughs> petrified. And you got to remember, he's been president now for, you know, eight years, you know, seven years. And he's answered lots of questions, been in a lot of stressful situations. But he's very stressed out as this question is being answered. And that's when he says, I can't reveal anything. So Barack, what Barack does is he walks around the questions, and but he doesn't really lie. Like he has this, the, the latest one he did was this little girl. I don't know if you know the story. Oh, of this yeah, on, on Ellen. On Ellen. So this little uh -huh. girl, she's Ellen. this pr six-year-old presidential expert. She knows everything about the presidents and whatever. And she goes on the show, and this is totally orchestrated. Because um, if you see Ben Hansen, I asked him to do a review on it, and he did. He actually shows an earlier show where they show this kid's cue cards. And the kid can't read yet. She's only six years old. She can't really read. And so the questions they have for her are all picture questions cue cards so they show these cue cards and you can see that when she asks the question she's looking off to the right and she's looked like she's reading off a cue card to the right and when barack answers the question he's looking straight ahead he's reading off a cue card straight ahead of him and so she asks him they, they say uh have you got a, a question for the president and she says yeah are aliens real and he never answers the question he he basically walks around the question and he says first of all he stalls for time and he says what do you think and then she says, yeah, I think so. And then he said, well, where did you learn that? And he said, on, on the America's Book of Secrets. And then Ellen makes a joke, oh, well, okay, the secret's already out. And then that's when Barack says, well, uh, I can't remember what the exact wording is, but he basically says, when we discover, we haven't talked to them yet or something like that, but when we do, you'll be the first person that I'll tell. So he basically doesn't answer the question, are aliens real? He walks around it by reading off the cue card this other uh, canned response. So that's what Brock is doing. And I think what, what is happening is I, I'm pretty sure Barack is um, uncomfortable with the issue. And I've heard from uh, people close, one person, two people, very close, and they showed me a link that went right to the White House, to Barack Obama. And I, I was just floored when he showed me this this link that he had. And the the story that they were telling me is that they wanted out. And it was very bizarre. They said they wanted out. They're trying to figure out how to do it. And they talked about this uh, a retired general who was uh, with the CIA and people that were these sort of retired people that are trying to orchestrate this disclosure thing. And they said they want it out, but they don't want the government's fingerprints on it. And I said to this guy who was telling me, who's not a government employee or anything. This is just somebody who the government has gotten very interested in. And I said, well, good luck. I mean, how, how do you do that? I mean, how do you disclose all the government's fingerprints on him? And it's going to be immediately the government's going to be uh, targeted. So um, Barack, I think, is uncomfortable. This is what I've heard from behind the scenes. And they're trying to figure a way to get this thing out. And um, so when, when I look at it, you see a number of things that have happened during the, the Obama administration that show – for example, even the Will Smith comment where he talks, uh, you know, we, I can neither confirm nor deny that extraterrestrials have visited the Earth. He knew that was going to get out. He knew that that would become public. And so why did he say it? I mean, it's almost like he's taking a chance where some reporter is going to say, what's the deal, Mr. President? Is this for real? And start asking him questions. And then you, you could blow the whole cover up. So he's, he's doing this. And, and some of the things he did that I say indicate that, that he's trying to sort of gradually disclose this thing are um, – the story of Chase Brandon. Chase Brandon was this high-level CIA guy um, who uh, was second second most powerful guy in the CIA to be able to talk publicly on behalf of the, the CIA director. 
who goes on coast to coast in front of like four million plus people and has this book that comes out on the 65th anniversary of Roswell, which is not really a coincidence. Mm -hmm. uh, and the book has been read eight times by the CIA, which means the CIA basically wrote the book. They basically said, change this, change this, put this name in, change this date and stuff. And he comes out and he basically says, Roswell, I, found, I saw in these files in this in this box and at Langley and uh, Roswell was real and it was extraterrestrial and there were cadavers but I'm not going to tell you anything more and that story <laughs> sort of hit hit the wire but then everybody sort of dropped it and the key the key part to that that I say is significant is there's no way the CIA would orchestrate this thing and allow him to come out without Barack Obama's green light because you, people sort of think that the CIA works on its own like you know they're doing their own thing they do not if you listen to Chase Brandon or if you go to the to the um, Chase Brandon says the CIA's role is to work for the people at 60,000 feet and that is the president uh, the executive office uh, the chairman of the House and Senate intelligence committees that's who the CIA works for they provide the best intelligence for those for those people that's all they do they don't sell Trump steaks they don't sell cars they don't do anything else. That's all they do is they provide intelligence for the president of the United States. So when somebody from the CIA, a high-level guy like from the CIA, goes public and does this, it has to have the approval. I say it has to have the approval of the president because if it goes south, if suddenly this the New York Times picks it up and starts an investigation, they're going to the president because the president is responsible. So he does that, and uh, this thing with uh, with Will Smith's son, and. Um, there's things that he does. Oh, what's the other one? The other one was a couple of months ago, if you remember, suddenly the CIA, who says, we have not been in UFOs from, since 1952. Uh, you know, we're not interested in UFOs. Uh, there's no U there's no ETs here. There's no cover-up. Suddenly puts these two almost like pro-UFO articles on its website. Mm -hmm. On the front page of its website, the how to investigate a UFO, and it's not putting down UFOs. It's not saying UFOs don't exist. It's basically like a straight-up piece on how to investigate a flying saucer sighting. And then they start putting it on their tweet page, and they start tweeting it. And again, I would say that has to have the approval of the President of the United States, because they're not going to do that without some sort of approval. So you can see these sort of back backroom maneuvers that are taking place, which goes to what I think is the whole um, um, crux of the story, is that the, all this stuff really has got nothing to do with Hillary Clinton, this latest uh, thing that everybody's on now. It has to do with John Podesta. And so I'll sort of see if you got a question, and then we'll get yeah, into we the Podesta thing. But the John Podesta, I, people, especially when I put stuff on Facebook, they'll, the, the Hillary haters will come out, and I always say the same thing. I say, don't watch the puppet. Watch the puppet master, because Hillary has only answered four questions. Everything is John Podesta. It's really got not a lot to do with Hillary Clinton, except the fact that she's very interested in the subject. Okay, so it, what I get is the president, instead of lying, is saying, I ain't talking. Uh, and, uh, and yet his mouthpieces uh, that represent his administration are talking in their hints. And one of the things that, uh, like Andy Vishago and others are saying, is that, uh, and I think Steve Bassett too, Steve Bassett, yeah. is that it's got it, uh, that if it's apparent that uh, the Republicans' man is going to get in, then uh, Obama. I uh, will uh, uh, get the credit for disclosure by doing it, but if it's uh, Hillary, he uh, he can relax and let it be her uh, shot. I think I think um, Steve said he thought for sure that Obama's going to release it. But yeah, he did. He's not here to talk to himself, so we'll have to have have did, both of you. Well, on you're going to have him on next week, right? You're having him on uh, next week. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So we'll here, here's a question for him. Here's a question. Does he have any inside information that Obama is going to do it, or does he think that it's going to happen because of the situation? Because what I would say is a little bit different. What I would say, I call it the Podesta box. Mm -hmm. Podesta is, and I've, I've detailed this on my, web, on, on my Facebook site. Not, I haven't put much of this on my website, but if you look at Podesta, he, you can get a lot of dirt on the Clintons, but you're not going to find any dirt on Podesta. Podesta is a pretty straight shooting guy. Uh, he has only a couple of interests in his life. He's big into cooking. He's big into running. He's, he's a, a marathon guy. And he, the most important thing about him is he's what's called a Madison man. He he's belongs to the Madison Foundation. He is interested in James Madison. And James Madison, uh, uh, a strange story is that if you remember the Danny Sheen story, it takes place in the Madison building, which is the ideal building for this to happen. He tells a story about being in the Madison building as it was opening. This is one of the two main buildings of the Library of Congress in, in Washington. 
and it's the Madison Building. And above the front door of, of the Madison, they have this inscribed into the into the uh, the, the limestone there. And it talks about the, this whole idea that John Podesta lives and breathes about open government, that you cannot run a government unless the people know what's going on. It's, it's, a, it's a farce. If the people don't know what's going on, John Podesta puts it, you cannot even vote. If you don't know what the government's doing, your vote is totally useless because you don't know what you're voting on. You have to know. So he's a big guy on open government, and he's not just UFO open government. He has, for example, uh, in a couple of years ago, he actually did an op-ed piece Maybe it's before he went back to the Obama administration, but he does an op-ed piece, which, of course, is going to hurt Obama badly, where he says, um, you have to release the files on the drones in the Middle East. He said, we've yes. killed four Americans in the Middle East, and you have to release the files. So he's big on open government, and that's his, his key thing. And he he's um, uh, also, of course, very interested in UFOs. So uh, John Podesta... Um, Began, he, he was on a, a couple of uh, committees on secrecy. 1997, there was a big congressional uh, uh, con- uh, investigation in secrecy. He was on that, and he's, he was very big. He, he was with Bill Clinton the day he walked into the White House, and he said, I walked out the door with him. So he, he's big with the, the Clintons. He's the guy that cleaned up the Monica Lewinsky mess. He's yeah. the guy that took uh, Hillary Clinton to task for the uh, Travelgate uh, scandal, and uh, apparently she went on his, his his blacklist for a number of years. She wouldn't talk to him, and now he's running her campaign. So the Clintons are very indebted to Podesta. So you have this guy who's very much into open government, and he's very much an environmentalist, which makes me start to think he's he's like the rest of us. He's down the rat hole on on UFO stuff, and he's big, hugely big on on the environment, on on saving the the planet, which makes me think maybe this guy's an experiencer. Maybe he's, he didn't just have a sighting. He's, maybe it's more than that. I, we, but we don't really know what got John Podesta so fired up about uh, the UFO subject. But he's he's fascinated with the subject. So anyway, he, he's in the Clinton administration, and this is what gets back to this thing about the president knows. Is in people may not realize uh, Bill Clinton sort of was pressured by. Podesta, but Bill Clinton is sort of an open government guy as well. And in 1994, uh, uh, Podesta was with him, and in one stroke of a pen in 1994, through an executive order, and this is where it comes down to understanding the Constitution when it comes down to how the UFO cover-up works. Um, In 1994, Bill Clinton um, signed an executive order in which he declassified 15% of all the material in the National Archives at the stroke of a pen. He just said, it's all declassified. These are all World War II records that were still being held a secret. And Bill disclosed, he, he, he released 15% in one stroke of a pen. In 1995, he does the famous exor- executive order. It was, I think it was 15829, which um, was the executive order that said anything over 25 years – uh, in a document has to be declassified unless you can fit it into one of six exemptions for national security, privacy, all these these different things. But if you don't, you can't. If it, there's no reason to keep it classified, it has to be declassified. And since 1995, for the first 10 years after that executive order was signed, there was one billion pages of documents were declassified, but under that executive order. In 1996, he he, he does a, an order which releases all the satellite photograph material that had been withheld for 30 or 40 years, all the corona satellite photos and the spy photos and stuff like that. So Bill Clinton, in his administration, it's like well over, I don't know how many billion plus documents were declassified. So Podesta is big on that. So he was, But he was trying to push uh, Bill, I'm pretty sure, to disclose the UFO thing. And Bill, for whatever reason, didn't want to go with it. He, d- he didn't want to do it. And I say the president can at the stroke of a pen declassify the entire UFO thing. You can just stroke it out. Because if you look, when it comes to classification, people will say, well, the president isn't cleared to know. And this is where everybody goes off the rails. People say, well, he doesn't have the need to know. He, you know, There's, there's people running around that say they got a security clearance 15 levels above the president. Let me absolutely guarantee you the president does not have a security clearance. The president doesn't need a security clearance. And he doesn't need a security clearance because security clearances and secrecy the, the secret, uh, restricted, top secret, all the, 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 the code name stuff, none of that is done by law. It's all done by executive order. All exe- that, that started in 1940 
Roosevelt, to protect the secrets during World War II, signed an executive order that established the classifications of, restri of restricted or confidential and secret. Uh, Truman added top secret. Uh, Eisenhower added um, material for national security, which really took the, made the thing take off. All security, all classification is under the control of the president of the United States. It's all run out of the executive office of the president. So you can't say, well, I've got a security clearance 15 levels above the president because the president is running it. He's running the, the classification. He's running the secrecy, and he doesn't have a security clearance. He can see whatever he wants, and they may tell him, stay away from this subject, don't go near the subject, whatever. If something happens, we'll read you in on it. And he hasn't got time to read a lot of the a lot of the stuff. But basically, you have to have the president in charge of of of, of what's going on because he's the guy that's, that's signing the secrecy order. So, um, for whatever reason, Bill Clinton didn't do it. Then Barack Obama goes to the or he goes to the Barack Obama administration, and what you see is Barack Obama again doing something that he knew. Well, it was public. He did it publicly, and that was Barack, uh, uh, Podesta comes back. In I think it was September or October of 2013, he goes back to the Barack Obama administration. He's working on um, uh, global warming, on energy policy, and on uh, classification, this kind of stuff. So he goes back to, to Barack. The day after he enters the Barack administration, Barack goes and he's giving an award at the at the Kennedy Center and he's giving an award to Shirley MacLaine and that's when he stands up and again this is going to get out he, he does this and you can see that he knows the history and he says you know uh, you know when you become a president uh, people ask you about Area 51 and uh, well I didn't know what was going on so I had to phone up Shirley MacLaine and of course everybody laughs you know and, and it's a big joke whatever. And then he says, you know, I'm probably the first president to publicly mention Area 51 in, in, in the public. And that's true. He, he knew the history. He knew that he was the first guy to actually sort of admit that this was real in public. And, and this is the day after Brock, uh, after Podesta enters his administration. So you can see that, that he's playing with this thing. But he can't convince Brock to make the move. Although Brock is doing these sort of indirect things, like putting uh, Chase Brandon out mm -hmm. by allowing the CIA to put this stuff on the website, and maybe he's doing that because he's under pressure from Podesta or whatever. And then what what happens is the day he leaves the administration, Podesta makes this famous tweet. And I remember talking to Steve Bassett about this, about how why what what this tweet meant, and we knew this was extremely important. So at least Steve and I have been on this that we know something was happening a year ago, in February of 2015. We knew something was up when Podesta put this tweet out. Because if you're a high-level um, guy in the government, you do not embarrass the President of the United States as you're leaving by doing a tweet about UFOs and sort of embarrassing the President that, you know, you, you, you didn't come clean on the UFO thing. But he's covering himself because what happened was when I filed all the stuff with the Clinton Library, what happened was, as soon as uh, Obama went back, or no, when Podesta went back to the Obama administration in 2013, the Washington Post said, in a, in a piece that Podesta saw, said, now, as soon as Podesta leaves, or Obama leaves the White House, everybody's going to be asking for all the co correspondence between Podesta and, the, uh, and Obama, and that's true, I'm going to file for it, and so... Podesta is putting himself on the record. He's basically saying, I, um, I, uh, the, the, the biggest disappointment of 2014 was I didn't get, I still wasn't able to get the disclosure of the, of the UFO material. So he's basically putting himself on the record that he talked to Obama, and this has now been confirmed by Tom DeLong, who's running around, who's work, Podesta's working with him to leak this material into the, into the public. And DeLong says that Podesta told him he had talked to Obama. But you could tell that from the tweet. And the interesting thing about this tweet is um, he copied um, Marie Dowd, from the New York Times. The New York Times has always been seen as this sort of anti-UFO uh, newspaper. And I remember Steve pointed out to me, I didn't realize, and that's the thing is when you, every time that Pedesta puts something out, you you read it, then read it again, then read it again, then read it again, then think about it for a couple of days, then read it again, and then you're going to maybe start to understand what he's doing because he's very he's he calls him he has, says he has the cult of non personality. He likes to sit in the background and sort of pull the strings, but he doesn't really get vocal. He doesn't really explain what he's doing, but you can see he's doing something. So he copies Marie Dowd. I could not figure out for the life of me why he copied Marie Dowd. Well, why would you copy a, 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 some reporter from some newspaper that hates UFOs? 
And it wasn't until a year later that I discovered I, I was I was Google searching her and UFOs, and suddenly I realized that when Clinton was in, and you got to remember that Podesta was there when the Clintons were there, uh, he was the chief of staff. Um, there, 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 there was two Roswell reports. The first, and and Bill greenlighted the Air Force to do these Roswell reports. The Air Force didn't want to do them. I mean, it's not the UFO, they want to get into UFOs. They were forced to do it. The uh, General Accounting Office was doing an investigation. Rockefeller wanted the Roswell thing investigated, so Bill Clinton greenlighted it. So they do this report on the Roswell thing, and it comes out in 1995, the final report, and it says, Mr. President, you know, there was no UFO crash at Roswell. Uh, there's no alien thing. Uh, there's no cover-up, and the documents are all missing. And Bill goes and lights this Christmas tree thing in November of 1995, and it's there he makes this challenge to the Air Force. He says, um, he writes this, reads this letter from Ryan. He says, Ryan, if you're out in the audience tonight, Here's the answer to your question. No, as far as I know, a UFO did not crash in Roswell, New Mexico. But if they did, recover bodies. They didn't tell me about it either, and I want to know. And the Air Force has to go back out for a second time, spend another $20 million to do another report, and that's when they come out with this stupid crash test dummy thing. We drop these six-foot-tall wooden <laughs> dummies with Air Force uniforms and parachutes on them and big, huge uh, signs on them that says, we'll give you 25 bucks if you turn this dummy back in. And people, miss, uh, because some of the legs broke off and fingers broke off, everybody mistook them for 19, the aliens in 1947, <laughs> these four-foot-tall aliens. So what happens is Marie Dowd from the New York Times is at that news conference when they make this announcement. If you remember the, 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 this poor Air Force guy that has to make this announcement about these crash test dummies, there's people that laugh and the reporters are just like, they, they, I mean, this is the stupidest thing you ever heard. And Marie Dowd writes an article and basically says, this proves that it's for real. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard, and this confirms that this is true. The, the, these people, the, the Roswell thing is real. How, how, why would they come up with such a stupid explanation? And so, the, it, like 10 years later, or you know, well, it's 20 years later, Podesta puts her in a tweet, and, and this famous tweet. So you'll see he copies Marie Dowd. That's why he copies Marie Dowd, because she's a pro-UFO person. And um, so he, he copies this, and then he comes, and this is where the, he builds the, what I call the box. And this is where Podesta gets dragged into this, or uh, Obama gets dragged into this. He makes the tweet, and then in October, Hillary Clinton is doing an interview um, with Marie Dunham. And it's a video interview, and she has, it's kind of a, you know, a, a powder puff interview. And um, at the end, um, Podesta uh, put tweets, and he says, uh, um, Lena, real good interview with, with Hillary. Next time, ask her about the aliens. And then I knew for sure something was up, that, that, that Podesta was doing something. And I real, you got to realize Podesta is the smartest guy in the room. Podesta is, uh, runs this um, – he, he started the Center for American Progress in Washington, the big Democratic think tank. Uh, Forty people from the high-level people in the Barack Obama administration come from that think tank. I mean, he's very, very powerful, very, very influential inside the, the uh, Democratic uh, Party. Uh, he has the first and last word on everything in the Hillary Clinton campaign. So when he says to Marie uh, uh, Leah, Leah Dunham, when he says, ask her about the aliens, I immediately knew, because I know how campaigns work, that he had pulled it. Because what you, what you do in a campaign is you have these focus groups. So you have the focus group, and then you put an issue in front of them. And you, you wire these people up or get them to push buttons, one, two, three, or whatever. And they will uh, get this thing, and that's how they determine what do you talk about, what don't you talk about. Mm -hmm. This didn't poll very well with the focus group. Stay away from this. Go to this. So when he said about the aliens, I knew everything had changed, that he had polled the issue, and it was no longer a toxic issue. Now, everybody's now agreed with me that this probably is no longer a toxic issue. Because you remember back in 2008, when uh, um, Kucinich got outed, he had right. had this UFO sighting at Shirley McLean's house. He was like 50 feet away from this thing. It was over the swimming pool. Him, Shirley McLean's bodyguard, and the bodyguard's uh, girlfriend were there. They drew, they make drawings. Uh, he had this voice in his head. Um, they knew something was going on all day. The Wall Street Journal had this big investigation of this thing. And he's asked in the presidential debate, did you see a UFO and did you hear voices? And, of course, he said, well, I saw a UFO, but I didn't hear voices, and, and Jimmy Carter saw a UFO, and he becomes all defensive, and his campaign is off the rails. I mean, it's, he's dead. I mean, he's, every article after that said the crazy guy saw the UFO. So it had changed. You could tell when, 
when Podesta brought this up, you got to realize a presidential campaign, Hillary's campaign, is going to be a billion, two a billion and a half dollars to run this campaign to get it to the to the end. And you are not going to bring up the stupid UFO issue and kill a billion dollar campaign unless you pulled it, which meant to me, as soon as I heard that, he's pulled the issue and things have changed. He, this is a safe issue. And the way it works in presidential campaigns is you don't care about, if you're a Democrat, you don't care about the Republicans. They're all going to vote for the Republicans, and the Republicans don't care about the Democrats. The only thing you worry about in an election is swing voters. So you only go to swing states. That's why nobody ever shows up in Louisiana. Nobody ever shows up in Mississippi. Nobody campaigns there. Nobody campaigns in Texas. You campaign in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Mexico. You campaign where there's, there's where the swing voters are, where there's these swing states where you, you, you try to get those people to move over. And that's what happened in 1995 when Bill Clinton went to the Rockefeller Ranch. That was the last place in the world Bill Clinton wanted to go in 1995 was to the Rockefeller Ranch. He wanted to go to the Hamptons. He would spend his holidays at the Hamptons you know having cocktail parties and, and golfing with his rich buddies there and he he the dick morris who was running the campaign in 1995 bill clinton was down he he was down in the polls and his campaign manager dick morris had said that the swing voters are interested in the ecology they're inter interested in, in camping and uh you know rafting and uh they're into technology and so you got to go to the rockefeller ranch and you've got to do the white rider rafting and ride around on a horse and stuff like that because they're going after the swing voters and dick morris if you read his book talked about bill clinton phoning him from the rockefeller ranch and he said he had to phone hold the phone a, a foot away from his head because bill clinton was screaming get me the hell out out of here it's like he was just, you know, it's the last place he wanted to be but because it's swing voters so again you have these swing voters so this is something that podesta thought would move the swing voters and that's what i first thought and then i changed my my opinion when i saw what had happened so it doesn't happen he he brings this up i think september october he brings up this thing ask her about the aliens so he's trying to encourage reporters to ask hillary about the aliens so you know this is going to happen and something's something's in the works but has got something going so Damon Steer asks her at the end of December, and that's when she says, yes, I've made this promise to John that if I get in, um, I'm going to disclose the UFO thing, and I'm going to figure out what's going on at Air 51. And he asks all the other uh, people of that as well, and like uh, uh, Kasich, he asked Kasich the question, what about uh, the UFO thing? And he said, no, nah, I don't really believe it. And he said, but my brother-in-law said, uh, he, he's really into it. And he said, you know, if you become president, you got to go to Area 51 right away and figure out what's going on. And uh, Cruz, he asked Cruz about it. And Cr he cr showed Cruz these two famous documents that I discovered in the in the Rockefeller um, documents that showed that Hillary Clinton was in the middle of the Rockefeller initiative. She was the key person in the in the in the whole Rockefeller initiative. But he showed her these two documents and, and Cruz was really sort of taken back by the the fact that Hillary was in, involved in this. And he said, yeah, he might do something on, on Area 51 if he got in. So everybody was asked, but Hillary made this thing and you can see the way she, she phrases it. If she gets asked, you'll always see she says, I promised John to do it. And I'm interested, but I think this is open government. So she goes with this John Podesta thing. She says it's not really something I want to. It's not really something that's on my radar. It's John Podesta's issue, and because I'm into open government, I'm going to do it for John. And then when you see John doing the interviews, um, he's done a number of interviews. You got to remember, he doesn't really do that many interviews. He does these interviews, and he's done more interviews on this subject in the last couple of months than he's done in his whole life. And it's almost like when the issue gets sort of slows down, as what happened about two days ago, he went back out and he talked about the alien thing again. And, and this time he linked it into black programs. He said we sort of need it out there instead of it going to black programs, which he basically confirmed that wow. the stuff is going to black programs. And that it should, it should, and it's this open government thing. The people should know what's going on rather than this stuff going to black programs. And so he, he, bring, he keeps bringing it up. And he actually, at one point during this famous interview that he does with KLS TV, and you gotta remember KLS TV in Nevada, this is just before the Nevada caucus, the, the primary there, he goes and he does this interview. They're the ones that broke the Area 51 story. And, and John Podesta, of course, at, when he was in the White House, actually phoned Area 51 because it was on the X-Files and he actually phoned Area 51 and asked him what's going on there. So he's very interested in Area 51 and he does this interview and that's when he has these key words. He says, I think I convinced her. I think I, ta I, I think I convinced Hillary to do it. And that shows you that he tried to talk to Bill. 
He couldn't convince Bill to do it. Make the move. Just sign it. And he, I tried to he tried to talk to Obama. Wouldn't do it. But he says, I think I convinced her. I think she's going to do it. And then Hillary will come out and say, I made this promise to John to do it, and I want open government, and I'm and I'm going to do it. And what John says, which is very critical, especially for the people who are making the claim that there's the Wizard of Oz is running the cover up, or or whoever is you know running the cover up, he says. She has to sit down, and she's got to look at the material, and she's got to weigh it and s- determine national security and release what she can. So he's not, no. he's not saying she's got to go and talk to the evil cabal. She doesn't have to go talk to David Rockefeller and his, his business guys from Europe or whatever. She just has to sit down. She has to look at the material. She has to make the decision. And he's talked about it before, about the way the UFO thing works. He says you have to weigh the UFO thing uh, Way national security on the one side versus what he calls unthinking secrecy. It's fine to have secrecy. It's fine to have national security. If it's national security, keep it national security. But if it's not national security, the people have to know. So that's when he says to Hillary has to sit down. She has to look at the material and evaluate it and disclose what she can, which is my new view on what's going on, is that she can put all the material. And Hillary's even confirmed it herself. She says, if I can get agreement... She says, I'll look at the national security implications, and if I can get agreement, I will release what I can. So okay. it comes down to she's going to have the material on front of her. Then she's going to talk to the, the, the director of national intelligence, uh, the head of the NSA, whoever's in this loop, or, or I would say MJ-12, that, that she talks to these people and she tries to release what she can. And John has said clearly, people say um, really nothing's happened, but John Podesta is a guy who was in the Clinton administration the entire time they were there. He was the chief of staff. He got the presidential daily briefing, the top secret briefing every day. He knows what's going on. He said there are classified documents that can be declassified. So, so we'll it's, st- always, it's yeah. always up to the president uh, to ultimately say, should I release this or when I've evaluated the evidence, is this in the interest of national security? I can, you know, anti-grav craft that uh, can uh, maneuver the, uh, uh, the way uh, UFOs do seem to always, if the president wishes, to, to be uh, in the interest of national security that we don't divulge this. Yeah, that's okay. what, that was brought up this weekend at the conference. We think this is just a, another way of hijacking the release of the information and they're actually going to monitor it very closely, and it's going to take a, another hundred years for us to really have enough disclosure to make okay, it. But that, that's national security. You're forgetting John Podesta said, he's on the record. This is, this is a quote. He's, he's on the record saying this in, in uh, on video. There are classified documents that can be declassified. Oh. And now, what I say, but it's what I say, let's get back to the box. I say you built a box. Because I said, you, when you see John, you read it five, six times, think about it for a couple days, read it five or six times more, and then you realize what John's doing. He's a very, very smart guy. So he has, I said, he built a box. He couldn't get Podesta, he couldn't get Obama to do it. So what he does is he says, ask Hillary about the, the, the UFOs. And then you see what happened. They ask Hillary, and then suddenly one newspaper picks up, another newspaper picks up, and the Washington Post picks up, and Washington Times picks up. And then May the 10th, the New York Times picks up the story. And they have never done a straight UFO piece ever. And suddenly they pick it up, and they run the story, and it goes viral. Suddenly it, the focus changes. And suddenly I go, oh, I know what John's doing. It's not even going to get to Hillary. This is Hillary is not going to take office until the January the 20th of next year. This thing is not going to last till January the 20th next year. Basically, what is happening? You see, May the 11th in the in the in the um, in in the White House press briefing. Suddenly, this uh, earnest guy, the press secretary for for Obama, is suddenly facing UFO questions, and the tone of the questions has completely changed. You got to remember. The first, the, the questions have, the last time a press secretary for the president has answered a question on UFOs was 1997, when Webster Hubble came out with his book, Friends in High Places. And that was when they asked, um, uh, Deborah Oren from the New York Post asked the question, is it, is, did President Clinton ask Webster Hubble to go out and look for UFOs? And he said, no, we gave that to the alien. And, and I re- write about this in this book, this, this Pelot, this famous alien from the Weekly World News. No, we gave that job to the alien. And then she said, and she goes to follow-up. She gets to do a follow-up. She says, my follow-up question is, is it true what Mr. Mr. Hubble writes in his book? And he said, I'm not going to comment on what private people write in their private books. And Deborah Oren, in a later interview, says, I sat there and I waited for the rest of the press corps to follow up on that. 
and they all rolled over and played dead because they were afraid of losing their credentials. So it was not asked till 1996. Wow. Right before that, the, the question was only asked to Eisenhower in 1954. And January of 1954, so that was the time before that a White House press, that somebody in the White House has had to directly answer a UFO question. And that one, uh, Eisenhower, who every so oh, Eisenhower knew what was going on, he played exactly the same game as they're playing now. He said, oh, I asked an Air Force guy, and he said there was really nothing to it. That was Eisenhower's a- answer to the question. So they've always played the same game. He played like he didn't know what was going on. He, the, the president doesn't know, and that's what they're trying to prevent. Is you Because if, if it's the Wizard of Oz or if it's some secret cabal or whatever you want to say, you can't interview them. You can't talk to them. But I know what the president's phone number is. I can give you the president's phone number. I know what it is. Everybody knows what the president's phone number is. Everybody knows where the president lives. If it becomes known that the president of the United States has been briefed on the subject of UFOs, then it's for real. You don't brief the president on a subject that's not real. If it becomes known that the president was briefed on the subject of UFOs, the cover-up is going to end in hours. Forget about 100 years. It's going to end in hours. because And, and that's what's changed in the tone of these, these – these, look at the questions. There's been three questions asked since May the 10th. And the questions are different. It's not, oh, you know, the, this story came out, yuck, 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 everybody laughs, whatever. It's serious, guys. This is ABC asked, asked the one question, and, and, and basically it's saying, you know, Okay, we have to pause. So we're going to pick up with this after the break, and it will be about three minutes, Grant. Thank you. Just hold that thought, make a note where you left off, and we'll be back in three minutes. Join Tammy as she uncovers hidden secrets about the spiritual world of angels, ghosts, and other entities that have been with us longer than we know. Tammy is a psychic, a teacher, spiritual coach, a leader in her field, and will be sharing her information and stories with you. So join us on Tuesdays at noon on Studio A. With Tammy's guidance, you'll find out who has been watching over you from the other side, and soon you will be talking with your angels. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Aloha and welcome back to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at FreedomSlips.com. And I'm your host, Janet Kara Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. <coughs> Sasha Lesson, and our very special guest, Grant Cameron. And before we get back to our show, I'd like to remind everybody to please go over to the donation button on FreedomSlips.com and donate whatever you can, $5, 10 15 20 $100, whatever you can donate. Is greatly appreciated. We do thank you very much for your donation. And we're having a super exciting conversation with Grant Cameron about disclosure. Will it happen under Obama, under Hillary's new administration? Is she going to, if she wins? Sasha, what would you like to say for Grant? Well, the, one of the most on? interesting things so far, Grant, about uh, our interview is that uh, the idea that the president is in charge, and like old Harry said, uh, this is where the buck stops, uh, rather than uh, some. Uh, uh, special uh, um, secret off-budget uh, cabal that is in charge. And so the, the president is in charge, one thing. The other thing that, that uh, strikes me 
is that the, the Tao thing is so important. I think it was uh, perhaps uh, Stanton Friedman that said the dummies that were allegedly uh, in the, on the cover-up story hadn't yet been manufactured or developed, and so that that seems to be some critical uh, evidence that they're that they're lying. And then Stanton Friedman was saying, yes, everybody in the government uh, agrees that if it's in an interest of national se uh, security, it's our duty to lie. <laughs> yeah, you actually have to. It's 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 law by law. It's what's called an unacknowledged special access program. So um, you have special access programs, which are these, you know, ultra high, uh, high secret uh, programs, black budget programs. Um, are you still there? Oh, shoot. Yeah, yeah, we're here. We're oh, here. okay. Oh, I, I just uh, something went silent. Um, yeah, so you have these, but then you have unacknowledged special access programs, which, uh, by definition, even the existence of the program is classified. So if someone says to you, "Is this program exist?" You have to lie. You have no choice but to lie. If if you and that's one of the problems I have with the whistleblowers. If somebody comes and says, "You know, um, I'm I'm here and I've got this information and I know what's going on and I'm going to tell you," my first question and I've never had one of these whistleblowers come to me would be, "Are you a patriotic American citizen?" And you say, "Well, yeah." And did you sign a secrecy oath to uh, you know obey the president, uphold the Constitution, and uh, keep the secret? Yeah. Well, you violated that, so now you're going to come and tell, say you're going to tell me the truth. I mean, if you – anybody – you can see that with the emails, with the with Hillary Clinton emails, there's these um, special access emails that supposedly uh, were on her email, and now they've discovered they were set – they were classified after they were on her emails. But um, the, the, the articles are written on that show clearly that if this was true, that she had these uh, – um, emails that she, that had uh, special access, top secret special access, and she put them through her, her server or whatever, uh, this leak, this is a class one felony. You can get up to life in prison for this. So anybody that comes and says, well, you know, I know what's going on and, and this top secret, uh, you know, unacknowledged special access stuff and here's what's going on, you got to remind them, this is a class one felony. What the hell are you telling me about it for? I mean, it, it, there's always been a problem to me with people who are claiming that they, they have this this high-level secrecy thing, and they're telling everybody what's going on because they, they will they will stop this because this is, uh, uh, as the Canadians point out, 1950. This is the most highly classified secret in the United States. This is the one they spend the most money uh, putting all sorts of counterintelligence stuff around. So you basically have... Um, uh, to me, a president who's running it, who constitutionally under five different uh, aspects, has to be running the program. You you can't have anybody else running the program. If you look back with the MJ-12 document, and people really don't read the the document, if you go back and you see the the MJ-12 document, you will see that it is de defined in the in the document that it was signed by Truman under a classified executive order. And a class, there's only one person who can issue an executive order, and that is the President of the United States, which means MJ-12 was an executive order. It's run out of the executive office of the President. And as I've always, I wrote a book before that talked about uh, how I believe the government was leaking this stuff. They're leaking the material on, uh, with a bunch of disinformation around it, and the... Um, they're protecting the classified material, and they're sort of releasing the, the what's called the core story of, of what's actually happened. And uh, part part of this um, uh, core story is um, this this uh, idea that, um, for example, that well, no, in 1988, just on the last days, and this may be. Uh, tie into Obama. In the last days of the Reagan administration, Reagan was also a very interested in UFOs. In the last days of the Reagan, almost like two weeks before, a week before the election, or two weeks before the election, they ran a documentary uh, which a lot of people in the UFO community have seen. It was called UFO Cover-Up Live. And this is where they introduced Area 51. Area 51 was first mentioned on that documentary. It's in a flowchart that was shown on the documentary. Uh, Bob Lazar would not go public on KLS TV until six months later. He would not even go to the site until six, about six or seven weeks after that documentary aired. So uh, you have Area, Area 51, and if you look on that flowchart, it has MJ-12 out of the executive office of the president. So you have th this, uh, this idea that you have an MJ-12, you have a very... Closely guarded secret. There may only be, um, you know, 
12 people read into it. I, I don't disagree with that. I, I don't disagree with the fact the CIA director may not know, defense intelligence director may not know. Uh, you can name anybody, but if you name the president, then I got a problem with you saying that the president doesn't know because there, there are a bunch of constitutional uh, problems with the president not knowing. And um, I don't know if you know the story. You know the story of Bush? Have you heard me tell the story of Bush? No, with no. Um, uh, what, what I say would happen, if this thing was being done, for example, you know, some guy with sunglasses and black suit walks into the president's cabinet, you know, the day after he gets elected and says, uh, you know, um, actually we're running the government here. Um, you, you know, we're, we're going to run the show here and you guys are just a bunch of puppets and we need you to pretend you're, you're running the government and uh, anybody that, um, you know, gets out of line we're going to kill or whatever. And everybody's just sort of going along with this government that's being run by, you know, some secret cabal and everybody doesn't really have any power. Somebody would defect. And the story I tell that shows that, there's actually a couple stories, but the, the, the big one was during the Bush administration, after 9-11, Bush started this, this uh, program to spy on American in te uh, telephone calls, Internet, all this kind of stuff, trying to pick up uh, terrorist uh, communications inside the United States. And the, uh, what people don't realize is the assistant attorney general or the attorney general has to sign off on all black budget programs as being, as being legal. And when this one came up, uh, the guy's name was Ashcroft. Uh, Ashcroft, John Ashcroft, refused to sign it. He said, no, this is illegal. This is a black budget program. I'm not signing off on it. And um, so at the same time as that happened, Ashcroft had a serious appendix, appendix, appendix attack, was in wow. intensive care in the hospital, and Bush sent two of his top guys, uh, his uh, chief of staff and uh, uh, maybe as the assistant chief of staff, into the, uh, the intensive care unit at the hospital to talk to Ashcroft to convince him that he had to sign this executive, this, uh, this executive order for this black budget program. And um, Ashcroft just looked at uh, the guy and said, just shook his head, and he said, I'm no longer the attorney general. And he pointed over to Comby. And Comby is the guy that's actually running the investigation on Hillary Clinton. He's now the CIA, uh, the FBI director. And Comby then was the assistant uh, at the uh, Justice Department. And Comby just shook his head like, no, I'm not signing it either. And they stormed out of the office. And they phoned Comby, and um, Comby was now the acting director at Justice. And they phoned Comby, and they said, you've got a meeting with the president. You're to appear at the White House immediately. And he said, well, I'm not coming right away. I'm getting a lawyer. And they said, are you refusing to meet with the president of the United States? And they said, no, I'm just getting a lawyer before I come in there. And so he went in, and basically he said, no, I'm not signing it. He had the meeting with the president. He gave his dispute. He resigned. He tendered his resignation. The attorney general, uh, Ashcroft, tended his resignation. The head of the FBI tended his resignation. There was a dozen people at the Justice Department all tended their resignation, saying, we don't care if he's the president of the United States. This is illegal. We're not doing it. We're resigning. And I say that if people knew, uh, because everybody, I believe, is trying to do the right job. Everybody up there, I don't believe there's the, all these evil people up there. I believe they're just people who are up there who may be totally deluded and crazy or whatever, but they think they're, doing, they're saving the world. Everybody thinks they're saving the world. And if somebody believed this was unconstitutional and illegal, somebody would walk. And there's been 13 presidents who have dealt with the UFO issue. There's been seven, Democratic uh, seven Democrats and six Republicans, and they've all done exactly the same thing, which indicates to me that whether right or wrong, everybody that's there believes that they, what they're doing is legal and constitutional. And if you take a look at it, the president, when it comes to the president knowing you have these problems that I would walk. I mean, you take the UFO community. I mean, no, none of us are going along with the game we're all fighting back we're not we're not buying into this thing we're fighting back why would the people at the top not fight back and you take a look for example if we're dealing with uh, ets with extraterrestrials we are dealing with a foreign power just like the russians just like the chinese there is only one person who can deal with a foreign power who can negotiate with a foreign power who can sign a treaty with a foreign power and that is the head of state that is the president of the united states there is only one head of state. You cannot have a GS-13 down in the State Department negotiating with the aliens. You has to be the president. So the pre if somebody realized that the, somebody other than the, the president was, was dealing, dealing with this very important head of state thing, somebody would walk. Somebody would say, this is illegal, it's unconstitutional, and I'm not going along with this. The other thing is this, this idea that he's the chief executive officer of the government. He's the top guy in the government. So if it's inside the government, that then 
whoever's doing the cover up, he's the top guy. Everything's flowing up to him. Same as the intelligence. There's 17 intelligence agencies, director of national intelligence. They all do one job. That's all, the only thing they do is to provide intelligence to the president of the United States. Everybody thinks that they're doing all this other stuff. All they're doing is providing intelligence to the president of the United States. So if, if you say, well, the CIA's got the material and they're not giving it to the president, well, who are they giving it to? The Russians? The, the Chinese? What are they doing with it? They give it all to the president. That's how it works. They, they give this stuff. They're not there to... Um, make decisions. The same as the military. People say, well, the military is, is making their own laws and they're doing their stuff. If, if you're a, a, rank, a, a military, if you take a look at their, their oath that they take, it is to obey the president and uphold the Constitution and, and the law. And so if you're, if you're um, a, a, a general or something, and I'm the president, and you, you come in to me, and, you, and I say, okay, I want the UFO stuff, uh, he says, well, no, Mr. President, no, we've decided we, you don't have a need to know, and, and we're running the show. I say, okay, fine, good, you know, see you later. And I phone up my chief of staff, and I say, you know, uh, you know uh, General Lesson, uh, I, want, I want his resignation on my desk by 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, and I want his boss in here. I mean, no president would put up with it. The president is, the, the, if somebody's insubordinate, if a military guy's insubordinate, he's insubordinate. The, the president, everybody salutes, and that's how it works. And even a three-star salutes a four-star general. And, 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 and it's, it's, there's, so these, there's these constitutional things that people would walk. But getting back to this important thing that, that people are sort of missing is this, this thing that's, that's changed now. As I said before, it was like the, it was a toxic issue. Like you did not ask this question. If you were in the White House press corps, you would not ask this question in a million years. And now they're asking, and it's, the tone has changed. They're asking serious questions. And they're saying, for example, the one guy says, uh, you know, is, is this for real? This is an important issue. He's not saying joke, joke, joke. And then the, 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 um, the press secretary actually rats out the president. I couldn't believe he did it. He said, well, you know, about Air 51, uh, you know, I don't have a, a tab in my briefing book for that. Um, I, I really don't know. But the president has indicated, he has joked that, that the president, that being president of the United States gives him access to this, the answer to this question. So you should ask him. It should be wow. interesting. Wow. I couldn't believe you should ask him. So he's basically saying, ask the president. Is and so, is, where is this? An article or something? Or? No, this is. You can go. It's on. If you go to um, the YouTube, these are all on YouTube. Uh, the May 11th. Um, there's two. No, one question asked on May the 11th. This is the one where he says. Uh, uh, the president is indicating he knows you should ask the president. That was, I think, the uh, ABC asked that question. And then on uh, May the 16th, and these are on YouTube as well, uh, okay. the, 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 they asked the question, and again, and you can see again the tone has changed, where um, they're asking these questions like, is this for real? Are there actually extraterrestrials? And the one woman who I actually contacted, and I, I don't know whether she's going to do anything about it, but I actually got a, a, a message to her. And this is an African-American reporter for some agency, whatever. And she says, um, th th all, there's all this conversation. And this all was started by Podesta and Hillary, this whole thing that Podesta got this. And that's why I say Podesta got this ball rolling. And she says, oh, about Roswell. And I, I need to know, uh, is it? I mean, is this real? Are you holding this back because of national security? And then she looks at the guy and she says, look, look, you're doing the dance. You're at the podium. You're doing the dance. She said, look, you're drinking water. You're trying to figure out what you're going to say to me. I mean, is this for real? Are there actually extraterrestrials coming here? And you can see, like, this is a serious question. Like, she's saying, oh and, and then he says to her, he says, um, there are certain questions that I don't have the answer to. And then she says to him, I couldn't believe it. She says, you're not going to get away with this. And then he says to her, you just keep trying. And that's, wow. so the tone of the questions has changed. It's like, the, the, and that's what I always said would happen is once the media suddenly wakes up and realizes that the president has been briefed, that there is a story, that there's something here, then it all changes because then it's not joke, joke, joke. Then it's like, the, say, the Washington Post or, or the Wall Street Journal. Somebody's going to say, there's a story here. I'm going to hire six, like the, the Washington Post did a couple years ago. Six or seven reporters, you put them on a story for two years on secrecy. They did the whole thing on, on top secret stuff in the U.S. government. So they put six reporters on for two years. They spend amounts of money. They talk to all their sources and stuff, and they flush the story out. And that's what's happening now. The tone has changed where the only thing that has not happened yet is Obama has not had a news conference. So we're waiting now to see when Obama comes back, they're going to ask him the question. And the mm -hmm. question is, is this thing for real? And we're going to see what Obama says. 
and it was almost done like the, a couple of days ago because Obama has not had a news conference. The story sort of died. It sort of died out. And then Podesta goes back in and stirs it up again on this uh, interview he did a couple of days ago in, in, uh, in San Francisco to this sort of computer group do you there. Have a, do you have a list of the links to these YouTubes and articles? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Could you so what? Or sure. the link to the link of the, all the links yeah. uh, and I'll put that on your page here on Aquarian Radio. I think that's what Steve Bass was saying uh, we, we talked to him a couple weeks ago and he said that the the UFO issue is on the table as, as an appropriate yeah. issue to talk about with the no longer talk order. It, it yeah. Over, right? yeah. and that was the new thing yeah, so. and, and I think this is all Podesta. Doing. It's all Podesta's doing because he's wanted this issue awry, and he couldn't get anybody to move on. He couldn't get uh, Clinton to do it. He couldn't get Obama to do it. And now, as I said, he's built the box, and he's built this box. And what has happened now? What has Podesta has created? He's created a situation where the White House press corps is waiting for Obama to walk in the room, and they're going to ask him. What's the deal with UFOs? Is this thing for real? And and they're, they're serious questions. These three reporters are very serious. That they're it's not like you know joke joke joke. They're saying is this thing for real? What's the deal? And so Podesta, when the the story starts to die, Podesta goes on this this group, and he's doing doing this interview, and that's when he mentions the fact that the black budget. You know, this stuff should be to the public instead of going to black budget programs. And he stirs it up again. And then, of wow. course, he starts doing articles again. And so it's almost like he knew that it wasn't going to get to Hillary. It's not, I thought first he put it, well, Hillary in a box. And, like, why would he put Hillary in this box? Because no matter what Hillary does, if, for example, Hillary goes into the office and she says, okay, because this is a big issue now. So now they say to her when she gets in, okay, what happened with the UFO thing? And so she says, okay, it's national security. I can't release it. It's game over because she's confirmed it. She's confirmed the story. This is what is always uh, that always missed with the media is the media never thought there was a story. But if she says I can't release it because there's anti you know this anti gravity stuff, it's, it's it's classified. She's confirmed the cover up. She's confirmed that it's for real. There's a story, and and that ignites the press. And that's what you need is to wake up the press. And I believe the press has been woken up. That's where Steve and I agree is that the tone has changed. It's not a toxic issue. The the press suddenly realizes there's a story here. They never believed there was a story. When you get the New York Times doing a, a straight-up piece that basically looks at this, and you get John Podesta doing it, so that's where he's created, and I think he's uh, almost like he's created a box to force Obama to disclose before he leaves. So it's going to save Hillary, because I couldn't figure out, why would he do this to Hillary? But it, maybe he's doing it to Obama, that he tried to get Obama to do it, and he said, okay, you're not going to do it. And then he, he, he created this situation where he got the media to ask about it, with through Hillary made it a big issue, and it all because Hillary can all, always gets away with it because she says, "Well, if John Podesta wants it. I just want I'm going along with it because I want open government. I believe in an open government. I want I want transparency. So she it, so it, it's worked to her benefit that he's not really it's, it, it doesn't affect her. John's taking the rap for the whole thing, and yet the story is big because Hillary Clinton's name is around it, and Obama is now in the box, and okay. we'll see what happens. Oh, yeah, you know, well, just, just one thing that, that I suspect is that uh, if there's full information or enough information about the anti-grav uh, craft and their capacity and their capacity to uh, defend uh, Washington, uh, the whole Twin Towers uh, non-defense becomes uh, open. And that's what I think the people in government are really afraid of, uh, disclosing the murders that uh, they've perpetrated under false flag. Yes, yeah, well, so, so yeah. Obama answers a question, and somebody, one of those three reporters asks, yeah. what do you imagine he will say? Well, that's, that's going to be interesting, because he's never lied about it. I mean, he, he's probably tried to joke with it. He'll probably use the old, you know, the aliens told us we couldn't, uh, we couldn't um, um, release it. Something to that effect. He's going to try to joke his way out of the thing. Uh, the key thing is that the, the, the media are seriously asking this question. And if he does, all he has to do is say, uh, yeah, I got briefed or something like that. It's over. I mean, it, then it unf and, and you could have Twin Towers. You can have all sorts of stuff. What I say the big thing that they don't want is a consciousness thing. They don't want this whole consciousness thing uh, sort of unraveling the fact that there's this other aspect where, uh, you know, not just you don't need oil, but um, – the fact that this is really not a physical phenomena, that there's all this other stuff going on, and it's this complex thing that we really don't understand majority of it. And because uh, the technical stuff, they can sort of walk around because you're never going to know. They're never going to release how an atomic bomb was built or how a hydrogen bomb was built. So that kind of stuff, they, they people will uh, let them get away with. 
but it's all the rest of the the stuff about uh, you know uh, how how do they get here? Because that's the ultimate question. And the way they get here is not through anti gravity type stuff. It's this whole thing of of the fact that there's no time and space that they're able to move like mm-hmm. like an entangled mm-hmm. particle through time and space. And that's the kind of stuff where uh, you know it's it starts to show that the government really doesn't either neither have it. And they really kept the whole thing secret, but it, it that's where, where this guy was telling me that they don't want their fingerprints out, they want it out. They, they're, they, they realize they're in a box because I, I wrote an article, which is on my website, called The Reasons They Decided Not to Tell You the Truth, and I, I list about 65 reasons. And the one and I don't have the one reason now is the fact that the president is running the show. That's what they're. That's the main secret. The main secret is the president's running the show. They don't want you to know that. They, everything else they, they'll talk about, but you, they don't want you to identify the person who can actually answer the questions. They want you to think the Wizard of Oz did it or something, so you can't do any interviews. And plus, it's conspiratorial, and, and nobody believes it. But I wrote this article, and there are so many things. I always said, you know, if I gave the briefing to anybody with the 65 reasons, everybody would do exactly what they're doing. They'd say, well, yeah, I don't, know. I don't want to do this. You know, like, with the, you know, well, Mr. President, uh, uh, we're not saying it's going to happen, but, I mean, the stock market could melt down. Well, we're not 100% sure, but, and the president's going to go, holy cow, I don't know. You know, you're like, you start thinking, and they say, well, you know, give us five more years, Mr. President. We can, we, you know, if the aliens are evil, we can fight them off better, and we can better understand this, get farther ahead of the Russians and the Chinese, and, and you can drill another oil well. And, yeah, yeah, drill another oil well. Yeah, go ahead, drill another <laughs> the, pre- the, the president is not they, they all want to go down in the history book as being you know the guy who like Barack Obama got unemployment from 10 down to 4.9 percent and you know brought some this and brought that and brought in you know health care for some people and they want to be good guys they want to go down they don't want to be the guy that you know had the, the you know the, the sort of the world come to an end for a couple of years until it all got sort of sh- uh, shaken out because uh, as I say you know if you get these scenarios like the stock market is the big one if you get a scenario like with 9-11 they, they shut the stock market and the only reason they could reopen the stock market after 9-11 after three or four days whatever they had it closed was the fact that they said well we you know if anybody stands up on a plane and tries to hijack a plane we're gonna shoot them we're gonna have people on the planes that have are armed and everybody, everybody go oh, okay they've got it under control they figure out what to do and okay now maybe we'll fly again but what do you do if, if the if the UFO thing I mean if the stock market starts to melt down you know a bunch of two percent of the people decide they're gonna start selling their their energy shares and then everybody else starts shell and this meltdown starts how do you reopen the stock market the only way you can reopen it is to convince the people you've got the situation under control and they do not have the situation they have no idea what's going on I mean they may have some basic uh, technology and a basic understanding of what's going on but in terms of uh, understanding like you know the question about mr. president's been you know const- your constitution responsible for the protection of the American people has been estimated that you know tens of millions of people have been abducted by these aliens what are you doing to stop it I mean you go oh, 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 oh and he looks like an idiot they're not going to put him out there to answer that or the cattle mutilation question or uh, there's a million questions he can't answer yeah, yeah. and the president is the he's like uh, there's even a piece on CBC radio here in Canada today talking about the difference between Canada and the United States is that the president of the United States has become like the Pope he has become like uh, you know like a king there's the, he's almost like religious like a religious uh, uh, cloak around the president of the United States in Canada when you're the prime minister uh, you you get uh, kicked out uh, you may run into the guy at the bookstore the next next week. There, there is no Secret Service protecting the guy for the rest of his life. He's just an ordinary citizen, and he's treated like an ordinary citizen. There is none of this, uh, you know, this guy walks on water. But in the United States, the president walks on water, and you do not put the president in a position uh, in, in anything. To uh, That's why you have, when you ever have a scandal, you know, with the Iran-Contra, you know, you have a, a, a colonel in the basement of the, the White House takes the rap and he goes down with the ship and that's the way it works because the president cannot be influenced or Ron Pendolfi who was the top um, CIA uh, scientist was uh, and he's the guy who ran the weird desk he did the UFO stuff when he was asked about the briefing for the president he said we we tell he did I believe the counterintelligence thing he said we tell the president what he needs to know and hope we don't have to put him down and I went whoa and it's like but he was never arrested he was never uh, Cured because that's the, the, that was the the cover story, and it's basically he said the president cannot be presidents cannot be players, and that is true. The president cannot be a player because if everybody knows that the president is playing, then suddenly he gets started asking questions. And the cover up once you start asking the president questions, once you realize the president may know he may have been briefed, 
how long is it going to take for the how long can they hold the cover up together? I mean, it's going to come apart right away because it's going to be like 2,000 reporters on the White House lawn, and they're all going to realize this is the story of the millennium, and right. I'm going to get it. And and it, it just it'll unravel very very fast. But still now people have you can see it's changing, but they still have the doubt that the president ha- has been briefed. If it becomes known, and that's why I said to this woman. This uh, African American reporter, I said, if you get a chance to ask Obama the question, do not ask him, what do you think about UFOs? Do not ask him anything. He will walk around it with a joke. The only question you ask him is, Mr. President, have you been briefed on this subject? If so, when was it, and what were you told? Now let's hope she does it. This is a woman that asked the question to in the, la- in the last month. She asked that to Obama. We could get somewhere, and it, even his reaction, even the way he'll stumble and stuff. Because even she said to the to the, uh, the press secretary, she knew he was lying. She said, "You're doing the dance. You're you're at the podium. You're doing the, the dance. I can see you're 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 drinking. You're trying to figure out what you're going to say." And, and she didn't believe anything he was saying. So this this wow. distrust is in the media now, which was never in the media before. Wow. Has a question. Well, it's just that what you're saying is entirely uh, consistent with some of the history that I've been reading. John Lake uh, talks about. Uh, President Roosevelt had decided to go public, uh, and uh, so the uh, deliberate hiring of uh, uh, Orson Welles to do H.G. Wells' uh, story to make this big panic to, was all to impress the president of his need for secrecy, even though Roosevelt's uh, inclination and in, uh, statements he made was, we've got to tell the public. And so yeah. what you're saying, yeah, this is, it's entirely consistent. With oh, yeah. Saying. In fact, there's two examples I, I use in this appendix. I have two examples that show that this is exactly what happens. For example, you have, um, if you remember, uh, Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, before he went in, he was the congressman who was in the district when they had the swamp gas. That was in his district. And, of course, he was inundated by uh, people saying, you know, we want something done about this. And he believed that, you know, he would put in these queries to the Air Force and he'd get all these stupid answers back. And he said, we should not only have an investigation, we should take the people that, that, that uh, know about this and put them under oath and find out what's going on. This is garbage what the government's putting out. And so when you look at the Ford Library, there are 1,700 pages of documents, UFO documents, at the Ford Library. And I knew, I, I, the guy had done the index on this. This guy in Michigan had done the index. So I said to him, I said, well, how many were there after he was president? And he said, I don't know. And I said, I think I know. So I contacted the Ford Library and I said, how many documents? you got 1,700 pages of UFO documents. How many pages are there after he was president? And they said, none. Yeah. So he, he was he was on to the UFO thing. And as soon as he got in there, and I know because I know somebody who talked to him and he was briefed. Uh, when he when he got in there, uh, he he realized what the game was because people don't realize when when you when you're the president and you go in there, they don't say to you, okay, Mr. President, we have uh, we have aliens in in the basement here, and we've got uh, you know anti gravity craft and stuff like this, and. Uh, here, sign the secrecy oath. No, no. You sign the secrecy oath, then they tell you what's going on. And they could throw him in jail the same as they can throw anybody else in jail. And plus, you don't want to be the president hasn't leaked anything on any sort of subject. You know, he doesn't come out and say how many foreign leaders have been assassinated. It, it, it's his cover up. I mean, he, it's his, he, it's his uh, neck that's going to get, you know, uh, hung when, if, if this all falls apart. The same with Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter said, if I, if I, um, become president, I'll release, and he made almost the same promise that Hillary Clinton was making. If I get in, uh, it, it, unless it's got to do with weapons, he said, I will I will release the material. And when he got in, both he and Gerald Ford never used the word UFO. Take a look at it. Never used the word UFO while they were in the White House. As the, these two guys, that were adamant about uh, UFOs, and suddenly they get in, and they get the briefing. And one of the stories that I, I put in there, which is a dramatic story, that for the people who believe that there is some secret cabal, uh, Jimmy Carter's always been the guy, he's Mr. Honesty guy, you know, taught Sunday school since he was a teenager. He always tells the truth and all this kind of stuff. And Jimmy Carter is saying, oh, no, I don't believe extraterrestrials have been here, and this is his latest version of the story. Uh, there's a story told Senator Claiborne Pell, when he was still the uh, head of the uh, Foreign Relations Committee, was the top-ranking Democratic senator. Uh, John, John, um, um, John Alexander and... Um, Scott Jones uh, were working together at one point, and they uh, talked to uh, um, Scott Jones knew Claiborne Pell. He worked for Claiborne Pell. He knew Claiborne Pell very well. So he got Claiborne Pell to write a letter to Jimmy Carter after he was out of the White House that uh, uh, Alexander and Scott Jones would be in Atlanta, and he would like them to. He would like Carter to talk to them about UFOs. So Scott Jones tells the story that. 
They sit there and they wait, and there's no response coming back from the Carter Center. So he phones the Carter Center, and he said, uh, Senator Claiborne Powell sent this letter uh, to Jimmy Carter, and we're just wondering uh, when there's going to be, uh, w- when we can get a response. And the response they got was, there will be no response. <laughs> and this is significant because, Clay, because Claiborne Powell was the ranking Democrat. So for him to snub the ranking Democrat and refu- the, and basically walk out of this meeting, it clearly shows that he really didn't want to be asked about UFOs. And that's the whole thing with Pendolfi says, the president can't be a player. And that's why you start taking a look at some of the stuff. And it starts making sense. Once you realize the president knows, Lawrence Rockefeller, it, for example, Stephen Greer says, oh, I sent these, these briefings to the president, to Bill Clinton, and I briefed Bill Clinton twice through his friend, this Kevin guy or whatever. And when you go, when I, I went to the Clinton Library and I got all the documents, and there are a lot of documents that, that are in there from Greer, this, uh, this briefing package, it's like hundreds of pages. Most of the stuff is Greer stuff out of the 900 pages under the UFO file or the Greer stuff. But it says right on the front page of the front cover of all these documents, president did not read. And this is the whole deal. So, so Greer is saying, oh, the pre- I, I had the brief, I briefed the president. Well, he never got to the president. The same as Lawrence Rockefeller. Lawrence Rockefeller did the initiative, and he was a powerful guy. So he goes to the White House, and he gets cut off by the science advisor. And the science advisor is keeping him away from the president because he never got to the president, ever got to the president. And that's the thing. The president can't be a player. The president is running the cover-up. You can't have Lawrence Rockefeller having meetings with the president. He knows what's going on. He doesn't need to listen to Lawrence Rockefeller. He doesn't, he, as Bill Clinton described to Lawrence Rockefeller, this is like the tar, tar Baby story. Mm-hmm. You, it's the whole deal. You touch it and you get dragged in. So you keep the president away from it. And, and you don't let him touch the story. So he didn't get to the president. And at the at the ranch, the story was told that the Clintons went to the ranch. I told you the story that the swing voters and all that sort of stuff. When they went there, Marie Galbraith, who was the main person who was running the Rockefeller uh, UFO stuff for him, Marie Galbraith told uh, Antonio Junius, who wrote the Rockefeller report, and Junius told me, she said she was absolutely Sure, Bill Clinton did not sit down at that briefing. When Rockefeller did the briefing, only Hillary Clinton sat down for the briefing. So he's at the ranch. Why would he not go downstairs and sit there and listen to Lawrence Rockefeller? Because the president can't be a player. He can't be involved. That's why he he could only get to the science advisor. He wasn't there. Only Hillary Clinton was there. And the next morning after the briefing, no questions were asked, Hillary Clinton said to Lawrence Rockefeller, okay, we've listened to what you've said. Now don't ever bring up the subject again. And when you look at the Rockefeller Rockefeller documents, these thousand pages of documents, the two from Hillary Clinton are very significant. One is that she's helping edit a letter on UFO disclosure to the president. And when they did the first briefing for the science advisor, Scott Jones and Rockefeller went in there with Lawrence Rockefeller's uh, lawyer. They went in there and they did the briefing. They stopped on the way out of the White House at Hillary Clinton's office, and they talked to Hillary Clinton's deputy. Hillary Clinton wasn't in the office at the time. And then the second document appears that shows that everything going from Rockefeller to the, the, the science advisor and everything from the science advisor to Rockefeller was going through the first lady's office. And this is another thing. I discovered these documents in 2000. It wasn't until six months ago I suddenly the light came on as to why that happened. The reason is the president is running the cover-up. The president can't be a player. The president can't be in the middle of this thing so Everything is going through the first lady's office. She's not in the government. She goes at night with the documents, with the president, sits down with him and says, here, here's what's happening. Rockefeller wants this. And he gives the orders. He's out of the loop. It's unofficial. She's the contact to the president to keep the president out of the loop. And you start looking at all these things and it all makes sense why uh, all these presidents have never really answered the, the, the thing. It's always people covering for them. And uh, I will concede that a lot of people may be out of the loop, but there's no way the president to me is out of the loop. Now, Linda, it's credible deliability, yeah. yeah. Linda yeah. How, had a, a long uh, part of her presentation, the last one before I came to do the show, was about a briefing that Ronald Reagan had in 1981. Oh, yeah. He was briefed. Yeah. And she had a lot of um, notes that were taken and had Ronald's response. And so he apparently knew the whole deal. Do you have information to that? Well, uh, again, that comes out of the Serpo stuff. And the Serpo yeah. stuff... Yes. Um, it's it's this it's this gradual disclosure thing. I mean, if you've got Serpo stuff, I mean, this is a class one felony. I mean, if the FBI, you can track down who put this stuff out. I mean, you can 
it'd be very, very it'd take them like five minutes to figure out where the stuff's coming from because you know you know the email server or the guy that's receiving it and where it's coming from and stuff. It wouldn't take them very long at all to, to find out who it is. So this is not legitimate material. I don't care what anybody says. None none of it's legitimate material, but it does have legitimate material in it. For example, Kit Green, who was the uh, the ran the weird desk at the CIA before Ron Pandolfi. Uh, there's this uh, uh, Mirage Men. The guys that do the Mirage Men book and the, the documentary, they had this idea, oh, there's no UFOs, it's all just government dis- disinformation covering uh, you know, Air Force programs and there's no aliens and all this kind of stuff. And they were interviewing Kit Green, and they asked Kit Green about this, and they're talking about Serpo, and then Kit Green says... Oh no! Don't don't throw Serpo out. He said, you know, there's classified material in there. And this guy who was doing the interview said he could feel the hair going out on the back of his neck, and he started to sweat. And he's going, "What the heck's he saying? What do you mean it's classified material?" And Kit Green saying, "No, this is for real." And that's when Kit Green says, "Well, what would you do if you had the problem? What would you do? Well, you'd make up these stories. Oh, the aliens are eating our kids, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. And then when if the story breaks, it breaks, and it's like, oh, ETs are visiting, and the people go, oh, wait, what? They're not eating our kids." No? Well, what's the big deal then? And so it's this thing, you, you wrap it up, and this is Kit Green telling this story. So the Serpo material has legitimate stuff in it. And Ronald Reagan did know. In fact, people say, oh, you know, when the president stands up and, and says this thing's for real, well, then I'll believe it. And I said, well, he did. And nobody pays any attention. Same as John Podesta says. There are classified documents that can be declassified. And it just goes over everybody's head, and everybody just goes on, and what's the latest sighting, and do you see this latest video? And it's like, nobody's paying attention what, to what's what going on. What did Reagan say? That well, says what what happened in, in Spielberg, we got, we got Spielberg yeah. on, um, on, video, on audio talking about this. When E.T., the extraterrestrial, and this is, this is one of the things that, that E.T. was the story of the live alien, that was the guest of the U.S. Ooh, government. Yeah. This was, a, right. this was a, a legitimate story. And they, they, as they do with all this disinformation stuff, if you want to tell a story, if you're a top secret agent and you want to tell your story, you can tell your story, but you've got to change all the names and put it in a movie and, and fictionalize the whole thing. So E.T. was a, was a real deal. But anyway, uh, because the president can't go to the movie theater, he has a White House theater. And there's 39 people in the room. This was Ju- end of June, 1982. They're screening E.T. the extraterrestrial. Spielberg brings the movie there, and he's sitting there. There's two different stories, and both, I believe, are true. Well, the one is true because Spielberg told it. And um, near the end of the movie, um, Reagan leans over to Spielberg, and he says, I bet you there aren't six people in this room know that, that how true this whole thing is. And he told that to uh, Jimmy Chandere, who was a, uh, a, a film producer out of Los Angeles. They were doing a project in, in Japan. He told that story. But the story that Spielberg told in public, and that was that um, when the movie was over, E.T. the Extraterrestrial was over, Reagan stood up, and we know there was 39 people in the room. I know exactly who there was. The, the uh, ambassador to the U.S., uh, Great Britain, was there. The CIA director was there. Uh, a bunch, bunch of high-level people were in the room. And Reagan stood up, and according to Spielberg, and this is on tape, Spielberg says, and Reagan stood up and he looked around the room as if he was doing a head count. And he said, Stephen, we'd like to thank you for bringing E.T. the extraterrestrial to the White House. And I'd just like to let you know that there probably, no, and I'd like to let you know that there probably aren't six people in this ro- whole room who know how true that everything on that screen is. And he said it without smiling, Spielberg adds. And he said it without smiling. And everybody laughed. And Spielberg said, but he said it without smiling. So he basically basically said, this thing's for real. And yeah. we made it public. We put it out there. And nobody really pays attention to say, well, you know, the president hasn't said anything. And a lot of them have indicated, you know, fairly clearly that, um, you know, it's for real. But they can't, you know, they're, they're in a box. I feel sorry for the president because uh, what do you do? And, and one of the other things that people always forget is that this thing is very highly classified, and there's a lot of material. There's the, the, the anti-gravity stuff, but there's the consciousness stuff, which I say is one of the critical things. When in 1947, they recovered the Roswell crash, and there was a live alien, and the alien was talking in their heads. Believe you me, that's classified material. I mean, if we can figure out how to do this, talk in someone's head, man, this is, this is what we need. And that's very highly classified. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that, um, that puts the president in this, this terrible box where you um, he has to be running the thing constitutionally, but you have to protect him. And people always forget the fact that there is as much money spent in a black program on security as there is on the program. So in the UFO world, everybody sort of forgets about the security. It's like, oh, this guy came and told me this. And it's like, come on, man. There's, there's 
all sorts of disinformation around these programs. Nobody's running around telling you top secret material because they're going to go to jail. It's like Stephen Greer told the story. Oh, there was, you know, when in 1992, when, 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 when he first started, he said there was CIA agents flying from, from Washington to North Carolina to tell him to go ahead with it and stuff. There's no way that would happen. I mean, there's no way you're going to put the, the, the CIA just going to, you know, go and tell someone that they're the, violate their security oaths and say the most highly classified secret in the country. Yeah, you need to get to the bottom of this thing. It, it just doesn't happen because it's so risky for, for people to do. So what they do is this 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 sort of um, half baked thing where they're gradually leaking material. And Obama's done a done a lot of it. And like the you take a look at the um, this thing with Chase Brandon happened on the 65th anniversary of Roswell. The uh, Corso thing happened on the 50th anniversary of Roswell. You start looking at the pattern and you see sort of what they're doing, that that they're sort of doing the best they can, but uh, what are you going to do if you're in that sort of uh, box? Because it's your cover-up, it's your it's your neck that's going to, you know, be affected if, if things go south. And so they're, they're that's what I was told by these inside people. They're they're just they can't figure out how they're going to do it. They're trying to get someone to to do it, and and that's where I thought, good for Podesta. I mean, Podesta forced the issue. I mean, he he set this situation, which is now in a situation where they're waiting for the president to ask him if he's been briefed, and if, if he hesitates, if he, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen, and if they, if they if they accept it and say, oh yeah, it's a joke, well, or, you know, then it may die out. But uh, the the attitude's changed. Wow. wow. What about the experiencers? What's their role in all this? How do you see that unfolding? Well, I think the 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 uh, the, the beings have gone. They, they apparently, you know, they've gone to the government and and nothing happened, and they're taking the message to the people that this uh, it's it's going to happen through the people, and uh, that's why you have the mill abs because the government's trying to figure out what's going on as well, and uh, they're tr they're trying to control this thing, but uh, uh, the aliens are in charge of everything. They're in charge of the. That's where. Obama made the joke. The aliens won't let us do it. They're running. They're they're in control. And it was like, that's right. That's exactly what's that's just right. Yeah. And so you know, it's all always it's comes down, down to national uh, uh, security that the uh, alien craft have uh, killed a whole number of our flyers who just dis you see words like disintegrated, plane missing. Uh, these are ace flyers from uh, Korea, and uh, uh, one of the programs we heard there's like 150 uh, Americans. Who uh, have been scrambled, felt they were getting fired upon, fired upon the alien craft, and their craft disintegrated while other uh, pilots watched that happen. And so this is we don't have uh, <laughs> we don't have security. That's so part of what's, what's happening. So basically, it's the day the air stood still. And those who were exposed to that movie, the original one, not the Keanu Reeves one, but the original one, is that they they had control of everything. They came in, they they stopped all the power for the whole planet. Yeah, and that, that's the kind of scenario where if the president, if, if it sort of breaks that the president has been briefed, then those are the questions that are going to be asked. I mean, can they do this? Can they do this? Can they? And it's like like 64 questions a minute, and, and it, it, it never stops. Like Stanton says, oh, they can just say, okay, uh, aliens have been here, and uh, we're not going to talk about the rest. That ain't going to happen. There's no way. There's no way. I mean, it all just goes viral. I mean, like everybody, if the president says, yeah, this thing's for real, you could have people saying, oh, it's, it, now it's declassified, and you have all sorts of people coming forward with, uh, you know, high uh, stories or – what will happen is you have all these Washington Post people, New York Times people, who have all these high-level intelligence sources who they've never asked a UFO question. But if suddenly Obama indicates it's for real, then they're going to go, holy shit, let's go and talk to all these, you know, they get all these sources and say, mm -hmm. oh, is this for real, Obama? You know, and, and it starts to it starts to unravel. And that's that's the whole thing is uh, it's not so much maybe what, what it um, – any particular issue that's bad it's just you can't control anything once you spill the milk you can't put the milk back in and it, it just sort of goes out of control it's going and it's going to be like the monica Lewinsky thing it's going to happen like instantaneously it's it's going to be very very fast it's that's why i say you know that uh, podesta may have built the box for obama and not hillary i can't see this thing lasting to uh to uh her going into office this this thing's unraveling pretty fast how do you think the extraterrestrials respond to the information coming out? Um, they're certainly monitoring everything you do, and we'll know. Well, I think for I, well, I think for them, it's it's my idea that that anything is anything that happens is consciousness raising. 
Mm-hmm. So if it does open up and it, it whatever happens, we can see it as as bad. You know, if stock market melts down or if there's uh, riots or you know religious conflicts or you know whatever. I mean that we see it as bad. But if you look at it in a reincarnation sense of of, of the world, it's just experience. And 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 so like, like well, Steve Bassett has his opinion, and so does Podesta. Like it, you know, you'd say to Podesta. I mean, I'm sure if you said to him. Well, you know, this could happen, that could happen, you know, you're, you're going to force this issue and all these things are going to happen. But Esther would say, I really don't care. It's open government. It, well, yeah. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. We need the people to know. You can't hide behind, uh, you know, the pe- we can't tell the people for this reason or that reason and keep them in. in the people should know. The, the more they know, the better off they are. It's yeah. that basic principle. And I think the aliens would be the same thing, is whatever happens is it's going to raise consciousness big time, real fast. And uh, whatever happens is is to the is to the good, well, even though it may be short term yeah. pain. In general field theory, it's the perturbations uh, that makes the system either destruct or uh, reconstellate at, at at a more inclusive level. And I think that uh, I agree with you. After the chaos and the shakeout, the perturbation, as the preacher Gene would call it, we have a a, a possibility of a, a much broader um, conscious. Uh, entity of, of oh, the world abso- polity. Oh, absolutely. Even even just the basic thing. One of the main reasons is it, it's it, if if it becomes known, it goes back to the Ronald Reagan where he said to the the high school uh, in Maryland. You know, um, did the alien invasion thing, and then added. You know, we'd realize we're all just God's creatures, and it comes down to it'll no longer be the United States of America running the world. The United States of America will just be another couple of fish, uh, goldfish in the in the fishbowl. It's like there's going to be no nationalism. It's sort of like we are one w- world. I mean, it's just so many things. Attitudes will change, and that's the kind of stuff that the aliens really, I think, would want out there. Mm-hmm. Is, is you know, people don't realize this. That's why you know it might be an idea for people to go and look at this article. The sixty, you know, the reasons they've decided not to tell you the truth. You start looking at the stuff and you go, "Oh, I didn't realize that." You know, you look at it, and and that's where you, you sort of feel sorry for the for the president in there. And and that's what sort of started me years ago already. Because what I would do is I go to presidential libraries, and I had the same thing as everybody else, like oh these evil, uh, you know, evil guys up there and stuff. And I'd go like to the Eisenhower Library, and I would say uh, to them, they got eight, 28 million, pa- 28 million pages of stuff, and I'd say, okay, I want all the UFO stuff, and they, you know, you'd file and they'd give you, it'd be a guy archivist helping you and stuff like that. And I'd book to go in there for a week, and I'd be through the documents in about like two hours, because there are no documents there, there's nothing there. And then I go, well, what the heck am I going to do for the next rest of the week, you know, and I have nothing to do. So I, I found these things called oral histories, and they're really interesting. If, you, if anybody goes to a uh, uh, presidential library, and what it is is like, Sasha, say you're the chef for the for President Obama. And then when you leave the White House, they say, Sasha, we've got to do an interview. And you do an exit interview, and they say, you know, what was it like to work for the chef, cook for the president? Did he ever come at 3 o'clock in the morning and raid the fridge? And what was his favorite food? And they ask all these questions, you know, and you tell what your story was in the White House. So they, they interview all the high-level guys like Rumsfeld, all the evil guys, Cheney and Rumsfeld and Kissinger and stuff. And I would read all these oral histories. And and and, and when I started looking at them, I was going like, you know, I would have these ideas of certain events that had happened in history that, you know, there's a bad thing. And then I'd read the guy's explanation of why he, he did this. And I go, yeah, I, yeah, that kind of makes sense. You know, and I, and I lost this idea of these guys being evil. It was just like they, 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 were, they had sort of these rational explanations of why they were doing the things they were doing in the government. They just seemed like ordinary people that, as I said, may be deluded, but they actually believed they were, do, they were doing the right thing. So uh, that, that sort of changed my attitude on this, this evil thing. And even when you come down, you're going to see this thing with Hillary now about she is behind the scenes, very, very uh, forceful. Um, she uh, was basically running the White House, uh, very hard to get along with, uh, you know, she would swear at the Secret Service and stuff like this. And this book coming out at the end of the month, we'll talk about this kind of stuff. But um, she, um, uh, I forgot, I lost my train of thought, but she's... She's not evil, or she is evil. No, she's not. yeah, she has. Everybody has these problems in in behind the scenes that that, that they, they have the they have these these type of things. But in in, in basic, um, basically, they're all sort of trying to do the things. And and that's when I discovered one of the the, the other big things I think that the UFO community's got off the the rails when it comes to this thing about does the president know? And that is the whole thing about the uh, the uh, the speech, the last speech given by Eisenhower. That was one of the things I discovered going through these oral histories. Is uh, all the oral histories are there, and I was looking at, and they have an index of certain subjects. And I thought, oh, the final speech, the uh, the um, 
a military industrial complex speech. And I went, holy cow. And there was, I think at that point, there were six people inside the White House who had commented on the speech. And one of them was Milton Eisenhower, who was the, the brother of the president. And they were all asking him, well, what do you think he was talking about with the, uh, the, the speech? And everybody said the same thing. And that was, we interpreted it as a UFO thing that, you know, beware the military industrial complex, the government, you know, they've got the UFO thing. And the, this is what started this whole thing that, that Eisenhower knew. And then Kennedy didn't know. Kennedy was cut out that Eisenhower was warning people that he'd lost control of the UFO situation and stuff like that. And then Kennedy knew. And then the bizarre story is then, then it's like, oh, but he gave this, was going to give the stuff to the Russians, so they whacked him. And it's like, well, did he know or did he not know? But the story is that, that this famous speech was beware the military industrial complex. But if you read the oral histories in there, you suddenly realize that it had nothing to do with UFOs at all. It was beware the military industrial congressional complex and all six people talked about this and what it was was the what the problem in the united states is that if you're a congressman in california and you're building the the prime example is a1 tanks so you're bringing building abrams tanks and and you've got this deal and the congressman's got ten thousand jobs in his district and and building these tanks and then suddenly the, the the congress or president decides he wants to shut down tanks you've got a congressman who's blocking it you're not shutting this down. I'm going to lose 10,000 jobs. And, and that's what he was warning about was the deals between congressmen and the military to have these, these factories and build weapons. And as he said, beware the military industrial complex, that it would get out of control, that you couldn't stop it once you did. And the Abrams tank is a prime example. There was an article written called uh, ta- uh, uh, Tanks But No Thanks. And it was talking about trying to shut down the Abrams tanks, and they could not stop the factory from building the tanks. The, a- the Army said, we don't want any more A-1 tanks. And they kept building them, and they kept coming, and they couldn't stop them from building these A-1 tanks. And that was what he was warning about. And they took the congressional out of the speech because one of his advisors had said, don't offend Congress. So they oh. took the word congressional out, and that's where it became the military-industrial uh, complex speech. And so you see these things were near in there, and, wow. and that... That sort of fits this scenario, and, and it's the old idea. It's like if, if you're all these people, how do you suddenly stop it? Say Eisenhower knows. How do you suddenly stop Kennedy from knowing? You say, suddenly decide, okay, there's like all these people who know you're running this, you're running this. Okay, we're all going to get together, and we're not going to tell the president anymore. That, that doesn't make any sense. It's very hard in a government to shut something down. Once something is like, for example, this MJ-12 being uh, an executive order and being in the off- executive office of the president, how do you suddenly move it out of the executive office of the president? It, it's very hard in the government. Nothing changes in the government. Once something is done a certain way, it's done a certain way. And uh, presidents don't want to give up their powers any more than uh, you know, congressmen want to give up their, their power to create laws or whatever they're doing. Uh, it, it, you start seeing these things in, in different perspectives. But... Uh, I start looking at it, and you, you start looking at these examples. Like, I mean, Kennedy supposedly didn't know, and yet uh, Tim Good tells the story very clearly of talking to the uh, the pilot of the Air Force One that, that he was flown down to Florida to see the bodies. Well, I mean, if he did that, he knew. Uh, right. You know, Nixon saw the uh, showed the bodies to Gleason. You have the story of of, of Bush, and when you come to, come to this book at the end of the month, people will say, "Oh, Hillary was this evil person." Well, if you're going to go by that, uh, the top guy. The, the number one guy that the Secret Service loved was George Bush Sr. and his wife. They are on the top of the list of all the presidents. So he was this evil uh, evil UFO guy who's killing all these people and doing whatever. But the Secret Service thought he was the greatest guy in the world in behind the scenes. And and it, it was um, Bush, the famous story told that Carter asked for the UFO files from Bush. Danny Sheehan tells a story, but Danny Sheehan gets it a little bit wrong because he said, you know, President Bush. Well, he was never... Bush never served under President Carter at all. So you have this idea that Bush and Cheney and, and all these guys, they took, they, they're the MJ-12 guys, and they, they control the thing, and the president doesn't have any control. And Bush refused Jimmy Carter the, the UFO uh, stuff. He didn't. He said, you, if you want these files, you have to go to the House Science and Technology Committee. If the top secret files, the Roswell stuff, is not going to be in the House Science and Technology Committee. What he was asking for was the files for the people. The classified stuff, yes, but I want the files for the people, the, re- the regular stuff. And he said, if you want those files, you've got to go to the house. And the, so you make the point. He said, oh, Jimmy Carter, he was this guy, and they wouldn't tell him what was going on. Jimmy Carter was an A, an a personality. He fired people left, right, and center. I talked to people in, in his in – his, had worked for him. They were scared to death of this guy. He was like really, really uh, an A-type personality. And he fired George Bush. So he wasn't afraid of George Bush. 
George Bush never served a day as CIA director. He didn't trust him, and he brought in Stansfield Turner. He had worked. At, he was a Navy. He was in the Navy with Carter, and he trusted Stansfield Turner. He didn't trust Bush, and he fired him. So he wasn't afraid. Big UFO guy. Who cares? I fired him, and he said. In fact, he said, you know, if I hadn't fired him, he never would have been president. And so, you know, start seeing things in different perspectives. That's what I do in this book. I sort of, I spend a lot of time at the end going through this argument. And people will still argue, you know, the president's out of the loop and stuff like that. And I can agree with anybody but the president. You know, CI director, the people out of the loop, they really don't need to know. But it, constitutionally, you have to have the president knowing. Okay. Yeah, so he, yeah, he just Wait. maintains uh, he, a plausible deniability. Yeah. yeah. We're almost out of time. I have a question. Okay. So, um... Obama does his uh, answers to the question. He said, yes, I've been briefed, and everything uh, flows and, and happens. What happens to the election? Do we end up having an election? Does Hillary win because, you know, she, it was Podesta that's, that revealed this to the world? Well, what do you wow. think happens next after this? I have no I I just think it's going to unravel. Something's going to happen. Very, very dramatic and very, very fast. I we mean, have if that, new, that, Form of government? Uh, Will Obama stay president? <laughs> anything could happen. I, anything could happen. I, I just, I, I just, uh, um, uh, I don't know. I almost dread the, the day. I mean, I, I had this discussion with Dolan a couple of weeks ago, and Dolan said there, there's no going to do it. And I said it, it, the question's coming. I mean, all he has to do is stumble, and they get the idea. It, it's going to unravel. I mean, it's, uh, and and I don't. What, what, what would happen? I mean, it's like there's going to be just like a, an inundation of reporters and you're going to have all these things about uh, why we've been lied to, why did this happen, why did that happen, and they, maybe they've got something planned or maybe it's just Podesta who says, I really don't care what happens. We need open government. We need we need this. Because Podesta's big. If you've seen, he just did a speech just uh, a couple days ago, big speech on uh, global warming. Huge uh, uh, presentation on global warming, and that's where I'm starting to think he's an experiencer. So he's basically saying we're running out of time, and I want to push this issue. And he knows what's going on. He he, he knows there's something there, and he's forcing it out. And uh, maybe he doesn't really care what happens. The, the president could uh, uh, pardon in advance those who uh, have been uh, uh, who don't uh, hide the classified things that they promised they would hide. Yeah, yeah. And you could have a situation where, like, you know, Reagan says, you know, it's it, everything on the screen is true, or Podesta says, um, you know, it, there are classified files that can be declassified. I mean, he may stand up and say, yeah, I've been briefed and there's something to it, and nobody will do anything. I mean, that's a possibility, too. I, I, I'm just amazed. Like like Chase Brandon coming out and saying, it's for real, there are extraterrestrials, and uh, there were bodies, and nobody did anything. I, I talked to uh, uh, the... Huffington Post reporter, and he had a second interview, and I said, well, now ask him this, ask him, he says, well, no, we're off the record, I, I can't ask him that, we're going to have a couple of beers, I said, come on, the story just died, nobody cared, I couldn't believe it. Wow. So, so people, yeah. go ahead. Everybody. No, I, I just think that some, nothing may happen, but uh, it, it's got to go there, and uh, what I say, the, the key, uh, key thing to remember on all this, as you're watching, because you're going to see... Hillary making a comment, different things happening. Always remember the same thing. Watch the puppet master, not the puppet. John Podesta, watch everything he does. Look at his material, and you'll see that he's doing something behind the scenes. Very, I, I'm just amazed. The more I look at him, the more I realize how smart this guy is and how he's manipulating this, this disclosure thing. And I think Steve would agree with me now, too. You can talk to him about Podesta, the role of Podesta. He's the key in this whole thing. But Hillary has not brought it up, not once. She's only answered four questions. She has never brought up the subject. So there's an article that says the uh, Americans can handle the truth. Can they handle the truth? Oh, I think eventually. I mean, that's the that's the whole uh, Sasha and I were talking. But that's this the whole thing is whatever happens, it's experience. I mean, it, it may look ugly at the beginning, but it's all to the good. It's never going to be good to not have consciousness raising. Mm -hmm. The more consciousness yeah. raising, the more answers we have. I mean, it's like you and I. We all know what's going on. I mean, none of us have gone jumped off a bridge. You're going to have a lot of uh, of the 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 um, the, the, Sher the Shermer team is going to jump off the bridge. I mean, there's a lot of skeptics. We're out of time, Grant. Yep. Thank you so much. We'll have Thank to have you. you back again, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. You bet. Toronto. And thank you, all of our listeners. I hope you enjoyed our show, and have a wonderful day. Aloha. Aloha.